All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I am here with the two beasts, Dr. Mike Isratel and Dr. Eric Helms. And we are going to be chatting about training frequency today, more specifically about higher training frequencies. So we're not going to get too much into whether a bro split is superior to training two or maybe three times a week or give a muscle group because I think we are all pretty much in agreement on that. Uh, but whether higher training frequencies, maybe four, three, even five times a week for a given muscle group could be ideal for efficient muscle building. And just as a preamble, I really love this topic because this is one where you can present a lot of arguments for either one side, and a lot of those make a lot of intuitive sense. But what we often find in exercise science and things like that in general is that what makes intuitive sense doesn't always work out like that. And my favorite example for that is the stoking the metabolic fire with high meal frequency. Like, would you put one big chunk of wood on the fire or many small ones? And yeah, it makes a lot of intuitive sense. But when we actually test it, it just doesn't work out like that. So I'm really curious where this will go. And so, yeah, gentlemen, are you ready? Yeah, can I can I make one comment on your uh, introduction real real briefly? Yeah, please do. Well, first I just want to say thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. But um, we started with the assumption that everyone's on the same page that a bro split is uh, inferior to higher frequencies, mm -hmm. and I just want to point out that that is very 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 low on the totem pole of. Uh, what will potentially get in the way of you making great gains. And I do think that training a muscle group once per week with traditional training splits is probably totally fine. Yeah. Um, and especially with the way bodybuilders set up bro splits, they're actually not really training each muscle group once per week in many cases, <laughs> um, just because they don't really know how uh, exercises train muscle groups. But anyway, um, I would say frequency is, is super, super low. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of flexibility here. So just wanted to, for anyone who's kind of like, yep, eat your protein, be in a calorie surplus, train hard, and then don't train once a week. Like they're absolutely not in the same ballpark of importance in my opinion, just to put that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's a good point because a lot of these things where some pretty radical numbers that you will see in research papers and what people will reference. Another thing that comes to mind like that is, uh, training time of the day. And I think even in mass, you guys have uh, cited some paper which showed some pretty astronomical differences between training in the afternoon versus in the morning. And I was I was listening to that and I was thinking that, man, if that's really the case, like you would have to rewrite your entire training pyramid book. It wouldn't be like volume, frequency, intensity. It would be volume, frequency, intensity and <laughs> training in the evening or something like that. And don't tra don't train in the morning. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. And, and I, w I will say that 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 data. God, we're not even supposed to be talking about this, but your ability to adapt to something is also very important. You know, like it would be the pyramid of what not to do your very first time training it would be not training in the morning, but then it doesn't matter if you keep training in the morning kind of thing. So, yeah. 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 Awesome. So that was a cool introduction. Um, Dr. Mike, we haven't heard your voice yet. You just want to say something before we get going. Hello. Oh, huh. <laughs> so doc that was Dr. Mike. Um, and now he has to go. So uh, <laughs> thank, thank you so much for being here. So My much. pleasure. Yeah. It, it was always an honor. Yeah. All right. So, um, Mike, with that, I'm going to turn to you first uh, because I rem remember the last roundtable we started with you. So let's keep this nice tradition. So I heard you on a roundtable with Menno Henselmans some years ago, and that was a really cool one. Some time have passed uh, since then. I know that you have experimented with a lot of different things. You refined your methods. What is Dr. Mike Isratel's stance on training frequency as of 2019, October? Um, how frequently do you think we should train a muscle group in a general sense for the most efficient and practical hypertrophic response? So most efficient and practical are two different questions entirely. True. Uh, we can get to that one at a time for sure. But uh, uh, I will say that I do have a rather formulaic way to derive training frequency. And if you apply this formula, so to speak, you can uh, derive a landscape of training frequencies, which as Eric has already sort of preempted, looks uh, much flatter than you would expect with a range of frequencies being quite effective. 
some being considerably more effective than others, but none of the real world ones being super ineffective and also none of them being magically 10 times more effective. So fundamentally, the first thing we want to figure out is roughly how much volume can you train a muscle with, a single muscle group, and get a robust hypertrophy response, right? Uh, something that is above what I would term its minimum effective volume, below its maximum recoverable volume. And, you know, maybe even we could get a little greedy and say something between the two that comes close to a maximum adaptive volume. But we don't have to get exactly at some maximum adaptive volume per session. You know, we can get one of those per week by, uh, you know, so, so for example, if you're eating a pizza, you can eat it one slice at a time every 15 minutes. You can eat four slices, you know, every hour or whatever. And same idea after two hours, you've eaten the whole pizza, right? But uh, you sure as heck don't want to eat a pizza by, you know, taking a pepperoni once every 15 minutes. And you may have trouble eating an entire pizza in 15 minutes. I know some of you, Abel, you're at the tail end of a diet, so you might actually be able to just suck the whole pizza right up. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, both extremes may not be valuable. So the first thing we have to do, I think, is to discover what range of training volumes is effective per session. And we already have some pretty good data on this, um, agglomerated by uh, a few groups of people and people themselves. My One of my favorite folks, and I'm sure Eric's as well, is uh, James Krieger, who is hilariously referred to as Dr. James Krieger. Why not? You know, he's <laughs> like, uh, he gets an honorary doctorate in my book. But um, so James Krieger does a phenomenal job of data analysis. He's a very good statistician. And he has taken a bunch of data together on a bunch of studies on training volume per session and to try to assess the sort of meta-analytic growth response from all of them. And his sort of rough conclusion is that somewhere between, oh, you know, for intermediate lifters, three sets per session and uh, maybe 10 to 12 sets per session, although there's tail end extremes that go higher and lower that you get a, like a, a dependable growth response. So like if, if I'm training with Eric and he's like, I'm doing four sets of squats and that's it for my quads, I'm not going to be like, idiot, you need to do more, bro, right? Like uh, that's kind of, uh, it would be wrong. He would for sure get a good hypertrophic response from that. And on the other hand, if, you know, he saw me doing 10 sets of quads in one session, he wouldn't be like, dude, you're dumb. Like that's triple what you can recover from and there's no reason to do any more than three that would also be wrong, right? So we're dealing with a situation where let's just assume just for sort of conversational parlance, we say three to 10 sets per session is an effective way to stimulate hypertrophy. The next thing you have to say is, okay, how long is it going to take me to recover to productively train again, present some sort of overload, right? Uh, go in the gym and hit it hard again after a session per muscle group of anywhere between three and 10 sets. And the answer to that, of course, matters, depending on if you do three, six, or nine sets, something like that, it's going to matter. So if you do, let's say, 10 sets, you might recover maybe two or three days later, and then you're training twice a week. And then if you do something like three sets, gee, you might be able to train six times a week or five times a week because the recovery time course is shorter. So what you're basically doing is you're finding out how much you can stimulate a muscle with to get a good growth response. You're stimulating it. You are waiting long enough to recover to stimulate it properly again, and of course safely again. And we can talk about the difference between uh, the healing, other uh, the, uh, the uh, sort of reduction of muscle growth versus the the healing of tissues strong enough for you to be able to hit it hard again. It's a little bit of a nuance we can chat about later. But you basically hit it, recover, hit it again, recover, hit it again, recover, and a natural frequency emerges from that based on the size of your session in in terms of volume. Uh, you can get a number of frequencies that work very well, and they're going to work very similarly. If we dig really deeply, we can constrain the number a little bit further. But because of the fact that if you choose to train a lot, you train less frequently. And if you choose to train a little, you can train more frequently. Because both of those fundamentally work pretty well, you get very similar results from three, four, and five, for example, the training sessions per muscle group per week. The one thing I have to add to that before I shut the fuck up finally <laughs> is... um you know, different muscles do seem to recover at different rates. In the hamstrings, three sets of stiff-legged deadlifts or properly done leg uh, curls, it, you just don't come back the next day and hit them hard again. In most cases, you're going to have a lot of delayed onset muscle soreness, a lot of weakness, which comes with soreness and which comes with a lack of recovery. And it's difficult to sort of construct um, 
a program where you train hamstrings hard six days a week, right? That, that becomes really confusing as to how you must do that because you just kind of get weaker all week long. And that's not a very good way to progress. On the other hand, something like side delts, rear delts, in some cases, biceps for some individuals, forearms, if you want to train those, um, gee, they recover really, really fast. And some of that has to do with muscle architecture, some of that has to do with fiber type and a bunch of other reasons, but it's nothing you have to dig into the science about. You can just watch it and happen in your own body. Like if you do four sets of lateral raises, you're going to come back the next day and you, you know, someone who's training you is like, all right, side delts again. You're like, no way, coach, my shit is smashed. Like, no, you're not. You're going to be like, nah, I feel fine. Let's do it. Yeah, but if you do like four sets of stiff legged deadlifts properly for four sets of eight, you don't really come back the next day and say, let's do it. Hamstrings hard. You're like, I can't. Just walking is hard, right? So there is some difference there. So what I think is there's a range of frequencies that's effective between two and six times a week uh, for a variety of muscles. Some muscles and some individuals, because there's some individual differences there as well, are better off trained two to three times a week. Some muscles are better off trained four to six times a week and everything in between. Ta-da. Perfect. Um, Eric, so uh, Mike made some Really cool points, and yeah, same general question to you. Like, how do you think about uh, structuring your training in terms of the frequency side of things these days? Yeah, I really like the way uh, Mike talked about uh, frequency being emergent from the needs of the individual, um, because essentially the way I structure it is that. Um, well, first I will say, like, here's the data we have. Um, if you look at the collection of meta analyses on uh, frequency and hypertrophy. Um, broadly, if you look at the published literature, you have, um, once you get past training each muscle group once per week, there seems to be kind of a wash as far as at the meta analytic level, uh, favoring higher or lower frequencies. Um, there's a slight, and I do mean slight, like I said earlier, disadvantage, it seems from effect sizes, if you're only training each muscle group once per week. Um, but the differences between two and six are not apparent when you have that big picture looking at, you know, thousands of people kind of, uh, perspective. Um, and, uh, but, um, when volume scales with frequency, it seems to provide a, an advantage that might be, uh, independent to some degree of simply increasing volume with a lower frequency. So a higher frequency may be useful to increase frequency. And there's those recent studies, especially if you're training to failure, uh, recent studies that came out um, by Fisher and Steele, where the kind of the U-shaped curve was way left shifted towards lower volume being superior in the five to 10 sets uh, per muscle group range, but they were training to failure with a once per week split. And you kind of see a different response in aggregate when you look at higher frequencies and lower uh, volumes per session. So I also like how Mike was talking about, um, frequency being kind of intrinsically tied to volume per session. And I agree, uh, Dr. James Krieger, I'll give him the <laughs> Eric Helms honor doctorate as well. Um, his, his, his research review, um, has a kind of an ongoing updated meta-analysis of frequency. And also Greg Knuckles has done a, uh, an open access, uh, review of frequency. And, um, do, having just looked at James recently, um, he basically says, hey, evidence slightly favors a frequency of two plus days per week versus one day per week, especially if training volume is high. Um, but uh, there's a little difference in hypertrophy with frequencies ranging from one to six days per week on a volume equated basis um, with the caveat that most studies showing no difference there use low volumes and that very high volumes might favor splitting the volume up into more sessions, which is kind of the same thing Mike said. Like if you're going to be doing a crap ton of volume, um, for a given muscle group or movement per week, there's going to be a point where you're losing uh, quality if you try to do it all in one or two sessions even sometimes. So I think we're on the same page there. Um, and then the final thing I would say is if you look at Greg Knuckles' open access uh, meta-analysis, there's a slight favoring of um, higher higher frequencies with greater hypertrophy. So um, overall, it's either the same or slightly better to increase frequency. And then I think the whys behind that are very context dependent. Um, and this gives, gives rise to a lot of different options. Um, so I think conceptually based on that, the way that really makes sense to think about frequency is that it's an organizational tool. Um, and that means that it helps to have uh, less constraints. Um, I think when people get into it and they think about push, pull legs, upper, lower body part, split full body, um, their preconceived notion of what that is, 
sometimes forces them down to decision trees, like if then types of statements or funnel plots that they logically can look at and go, that doesn't make sense, but I have to do it because here's, because you're not allowed to tra train calves on shoulders and arms today, you know, even though it's been five days since I've trained calves, even though I need to bring them up. And even though when I do, uh, when I try to get 20 sets for calves per week in just my one session per week, I can barely move, you know, and it actually, I can barely do my squat the next day because my, my, my dorsiflexion is so messed up. And even though my calves um, have been recovered for four days straight, I could have trained them two, three, and four days ago. I haven't. Exactly. I chose to train them once a week for no goddamn reason. Well, because I can't do calves on shoulders and arms day, right? You know, because it's shoulders and arms. Because it's yeah. not calves day, I bro. even had, uh, and, and right. <laughs> if he hears this, he knows this is playful ribbing. I have a, a kind of a very OCD structured kind of traditional bodybuilding uh, friend who I was just hanging out with in Asia. And uh, he was like, what are you training today? And it was just kind of his natural, like, here's how I say hi to another bodybuilder in the gym. And I look at him every time, I'm like, you know, I'm training like everything, right? <laughs> it's an easier answer question, easier question to answer. What am I not training today? And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm not hitting biceps directly today. Um, and when I would tell him like, okay, I'm hitting, you know, uh, back, blah, 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 this and that. And then one day he's like, wow, really, really confused in the body. And I was like, Trust me, you might be confused. Your body is not. If you walked over here, you know, th that, that walking involves the entire body. So I think a lot of these uh, constraints we impose are very much come out of the, the culture of bodybuilding. Um, and you get a different cultural perspective on frequency depending on which strength sport or sport you're involved with. Like generally athletes don't think about what body part they're training. Um, powerlifters sort of do because they hang out with bodybuilders a lot. But, you know, essentially, if you did a deadlift, that might as well have been pretty close to a full body day, you know, so they, they kind of get away from it. And then Olympic lifters, like every time they train, they're doing a squat and a deadlift. So some of the the traditional wisdom that comes from power lifters, they just kind of cock their eyebrow out and generally just look down on you as being weak. Um, but that also helps us understand the interaction between all these variables. Like people will frequently say to me, well, I, how do you how do you recover if you train back two days in a row? Like it's a Ooh. binary thing. Like doing one set at a five RPE of a row is the same as doing you know ten sets of deadlifts to failure. Can I hop in really quick? Like a, a, feel free to say no. Yeah, but you got you got you got a long preamble. God damn it! I just uh, okay. I just have. <laughs> I mean, yeah, go ahead, man. Um, to exactly to your point, I I've, uh, hypothesized that there are two reasons why a lot of bodybuilders have over the decades experimented with higher frequency training and found it to be less than effective compared to low frequency training. And I think it's because they sort of dogmatically inherit at least two training features, which they won't drop. One is you have to train uh, body parts very close to or to failure or beyond. But if you look at the way most bodybuilders train, they smash every single work set. And two, they do lots of work sets probably 15 to 20 on average per muscle group, being that they take that as an assumption of what is training a body part, that question to you of how do you survive back training twice a week, you can answer back, well, if it's 17 sets to failure of back, I don't, right? But back training doesn't have to be that. It can be eight sets, two reps shy of failure, and then there's your three back sessions a week. So I think that's a huge confounding variable there two of them really training super close to failure all the time and training with super high per session volumes, which is a lot of the reason when people ask, well, why don't all the big guys train with multiple those high frequencies? Because they're taking in some cultural residue that makes the whole process not work. Sorry for the interruption here. Well, no, I mean, you, you were literally almost word for word going to say what I was, what I was uh, leading towards is that there's become two different dominant uh, ways of training, either low frequency to failure or high volume, uh, reasonably close to failure, but not necessarily. Um, and uh, both of them preclude a high frequency because you kind of have this interdependent triangle. Like if you max out volume or if you max out intensity, you minimize what you can do with frequency. Um, so exactly right. And I totally agree. And, and, and that's because the cultural ethos of bodybuilding has become, and I would say it's not always been this way, um, has become every training session must be hard and it must be there must be some high level of effort. So I think that's something you, you, you can, you can explain, but you also, the, the reason why bodybuilders don't frequently train in that manner, um, kind of that moderate or to high frequency training. Um, 
but you also can't discount it because that's something the bodybuilders like to do. So I think it's important to still throw them a bone. Like we'll find a way for this to feel hard because, or you won't enjoy it. Um, but I will also point out that back when the bodybuilding culture was quite different, um, back when there was much more, uh, crosstalk and almost the same community between weightlifting, uh, proto powerlifting, um, bodybuilding, and they were all essentially the same. And there was less of that kind of masochism tied into it. Uh, you didn't have to really, really get shredded to get on stage. And some of the key principles of masochism were not built into the culture and getting strong and getting big were not even two different types of training. They were just seen as these things happen together. Um, the way that pretty much everyone trained from the 1800s till the 1950s before you started to get some of these dominant cultural philosophies. There was the Weider split, Nautilus came out, HIT became big, uh, and training to failure and doing isolation uh, became dominant philosophies and changed the cultural kind of talk. The way that everyone trained, and I almost mean everyone, I'm sure there are exceptions, was either upper lower or full body from until the 1950s. Um, so that that's interesting that that's kind of what people fell into uh, and is typically a frequency of three to six times a week um, of using upper, lower or full body with a body part frequency typically falling around on average three times per week, um, which is way different than now where it's like two thirds of bodybuilders train once per week and another third twice per week, each muscle group. So anyway, to answer your question on what my thoughts are, um, Basically the same as Mike's, except I don't necessarily look at it from a body part perspective, but more from a the movements used to train body parts. Uh, for example, hamstrings. I 100% agree if someone is doing traditional hamstring exercises, which typically train it at a long muscle length and with high loads, um, like deadlift variants, good mornings, um, kind of most bodybuilders won't go into the gym to train hamstrings and just do leg curls. Um, and then also just do one where they tend to stay a little more shortened, like, uh, lying or standing. Um, you know, if the likelihood of you doing a seated leg curl, which puts it on stretch or doing an RDL or a deadlift or a good morning when you train hamstrings is pretty high. So I think that, 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 uh, with the, the slight, the slight modification of what Mike's saying is that how you train muscle groups also matters a lot differently as well. Like, um, we've done some studies now where there's not increased, uh, delayed onset muscle soreness in deadlifts relative to squats relative to bench press and that recovery time course is the same. But one thing that has not been effectively measured is just how stiff is your lower back feel or how, how likely do you feel like you're going to get hurt or some of these more qualitative elements that are related to it that can't get picked up by research, you know? Um, so I think um, there's a big difference between a really tall dude with um, unfavorable body part proportion lengths to a very short person, like say Taylor Atwood training squats with a high frequency. And there's a big difference just between doing leg extensions, you know, every day versus doing, you know, squats, you know, one is going to hurt your knee <laughs> and one is going to hurt your hips. Um, so there is certainly, if one does come upon a higher frequency body part split that emerges from their goals, um, you have to be a little more thoughtful about what exercises you use. So that, that's kind of uh, my perspective. And I'll, I'll, I have more to say because I could just pre ramble on forever, but that's probably fun, plenty for now. Yeah, cool. Um, so my, my question would be to both of you, what are the top three mistakes people make in their training? Just kidding. That's not going to be my question. <laughs> <laughs> I've never answered that question. <laughs> I'm sure I scared the shit out of all the nerdy listeners. Um, so Mike, um, uh, so I, just, just in general, I want to dissect – some of the distinct potential advantages and disadvantages of training at high training frequencies, high in quotation marks, because there is not an objective definition, but, you know, say four plus for the sake of this discussion. Um, Mike, I earlier heard you on different podcasts and in some of your writings discussing how training at higher training frequencies can be beneficial, but it can also have some certain drawbacks, um, uh, would you mind going into those and then we can have a back and forth on those? Sure. Uh, just to make certain that we're not excluding half the picture, I have an equivalent list for reasons that training with much lower than necessary frequencies is bad. Uh, so I, I have the other side of the coin as well. Um, but these are some, just I say, you know, sort of hypothetical ideas 
that are sort of food for thought, not definitive, set in stone, for sure things. They may very well be wrong. But I have eight distinct ideas about potentially having too high of a frequency for the absolute best results. In any case, if someone brought one of these up, you were doing a seven-day-a-week program for biceps or something. You might have trouble refuting it. You'd be in that situation at the gym where someone's like, why do you do this? And you're like, I don't know, get the fuck away from me. <laughs> Versus, you know, having some sort of semblance of a good reason. So the first one is <clears throat> set to set performance potentiation. You know, like a first set on a, most exercises, especially compound ones that are rather technical, usually doesn't feel the best. Um, and sometimes it's your higher performance set. Uh, sometimes, you know, your first set, uh, especially if your warm up's not very long, can be not as good a performance as your second set. So if you potentially have a muscle that can only recover from, let's say, seven total work sets per week, uh, which some muscles are, are fall into that category, then just doing one set per muscle per day might not be the greatest thing because by not doing a second set, you're actually missing out on an even better set, right? It's, it's almost like uh, eating a meal, uh, eating the appetizer, and then waiting two hours and eating the main course. And the appetizer is designed to appetize. And those effects go away after two hours, and then the main course comes out, and you're like, you know, I don't even want to eat anymore, right? What is that called? Like getting, getting ghosted out at a restaurant when they don't bring your food for long enough, and then you're just like, you know, I don't even, why, why are we here, <laughs> right? You're super excited for an hour, and then you just want to go home. So there's some potentiation uh, that you can get from the last set, and that might last a pretty good, you know, two or three sets. So anytime I look at a training program that is like, okay, I did one set for hamstrings, and then I moved on to quads. My, my question is, why don't you just move that hamstring set somewhere the hell else, like another day, right? Another session. Uh, number two is uh, it's a very, very tenuous one, but I think has some merit is the increase in effective reps. So for example, if you do, and folks are familiar with Maya reps and some of uh, Chris Beardsley's work will be uh, sort of familiar with this. Um, you know, if you do one set and you get 20 reps on it close to failure, then, you know, maybe 15 of those were not as effective as the last five. But then if you take a relevant rest break, and especially if it's not a centrally taxing exercise, your next set might have only 10 reps with the same load, uh, same proximity to failure. But, uh, you know, five of those will be the most effective. And, you know, that's an increase in the fraction of effective reps. So as you do more and more work sets to a point, of course, which my other series of uh, points addresses, then the fraction of effective reps per set increases, which could be a good thing. Right, especially for training uh, fiber, predominantly faster twitch fiber muscles. Number three, this is a very, very obvious one, is the mind-muscle connection. Um, if you do one or two sets of, let's say, cable flies, just an example, yeah, that might be good sets and good performance, but you're like, man, I, I sort of feel my chest, kind of stuff's just happening. And if you had to stop and go on to uh, other exercises for other body parts, you might be like, okay, that was good. But if you did another two sets of cable flies, those second two sets right sets number three and four could be really great mind muscle connection and you really start feeling the crap out of your pecs, which mind muscle connection has been shown in literature to be uh, you know, somewhat a very small causative role in hypertrophy. Uh, so there's, it's not to be completely uh, just taken off the table. Number four is set to set technique potentiation. We've all been through, especially if you're working with new equipment, if you're traveling, but even if you have your own similar equipment, you know, your technique on your first set, even after you're warmed up reasonably well, can look a little iffy, even externally. And internally, it can feel a little iffy. But as you do more and more work sets, you know, two, three, four work sets, your technique actually tends to improve, in my experience, uh, both externally viewed and internally perceived. So as your technique gets better, what I would term the stimulus to fatigue ratio probably goes up as well. Uh, you know, every single time you have another set and it's better technique, but that's, that's really good. It, it injures you less over the long term versus... Let's say you, you wanted to do quads with one set of quads every day versus splitting it up into two or three sets of quads two or three times a week. Every time you come in, you essentially do your worst possible set of quads from a technical perspective. And you go home, you cool off, you spend 24 hours not training quads, you come back and you do the same garbage first set that feels like shit all over the place. Your technique sucks. You would have had much better technique if you had stuck around for two or three or four more sets, but you didn't. So that's a sort of knock on that. The muscle pump, I think cell swelling uh, is uh, probably causative hypertrophy to some small extent. It is not maximized with one or two sets per session. It's probably more like three or four or even more. Uh, that's point number five. Uh, number six, if you uh, train, let's say, just two muscle groups, you have to do two distinct warm-ups, uh, at least two specific warm-ups, let's say chest and neck, 
then you warm up your chest, you train it, then you warm up your back, you train it. If you train six muscle groups per day, you have to do a whole lot of warming up to stay safe. Um, especially if you do six compound lifts or four or five compound lifts, then you know you don't just go from deadlifts to bench and not warm up. Like you have to warm up your pecs very, very distinctly. So then the ratio of how much warming up you're doing to how much actual training gets you know higher than normal. Uh, and then all of a sudden over the week, if you look at it, you have a lot of time spent warming up or relative to how much train, maybe a little bit suboptimal there. Point number seven is joint versus muscle recovery in the long term. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, I suspect that the muscular structures recover faster than, uh, connective tissues and the, that together recovers faster than joints. Um, I, I think it's very possible if you do relatively, uh, low per session volumes to get very high frequencies out of things like deadlifting and squatting and overhead pressing and bench pressing and so on and so forth. I think your muscles can recover just fine, uh, from that sort of stimulus. I think it's by no means clear that your joints can recover just fine. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, periodizing frequency of late because I don't think super high frequency and volumes go together for very long because at some point your joints will just shred themselves because I don't think they recover as fast and I think that your muscles can out recover your joints. One of the things about super high frequency training is that it allows higher recoverable volumes to happen per week for your muscles. But I think sometimes your joints just run out of room on that. There are things to be done about it, like exercise selection modifications, not always squatting, sometimes doing leg extensions and leg presses. But I think that's something that at least needs some attention. And then lastly, and this is something Eric and I had a chat about uh, privately. We have a lot of private chats, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) He mostly just makes that noise. I do a lot of the talking. Uh, He pays me for this. So um, it's the local to systemic fatigue ratio. So for example, if you do two sets of chest and two sets of back, the... um, your back carries no local fatigue into its uh, training, but it carries all the systemic fatigue of the two sets of chest before it. But if you just did four sets of back, then those last two sets of back, uh, they are carrying the same general amount of systemic fatigue from those two, two first sets of back. They're carrying more local fatigue. If your local fatigue inside the muscle is relatively high, it's actually sort of a good thing because you reach failure faster and a lot of that local fatigue is probably itself causative of hypertrophy. Systemic fatigue is not very good for hypertrophy. As a matter of fact, it prevents you from locally fatiguing the muscle as much as possible. And thus is probably deleterious to training to some extent. So if you uh, are sort of round robin your muscles a whole lot, you train like six muscles per session versus maybe three and three, then you end up, you know, the later muscles really get short shrift um, because they take all the systemic fatigue of the earlier part of the session with none of the local fatigue to counteract that. Whereas if you train like the advantage, I'm not making the case for it, just an example pure chest workout that's 15 sets. In those last five sets, the local fatigue in the chest is 100% what's going to be limiting you. So all of those sets are relatively effective. In my opinion, they're too effective and they're going to cause a lot of local damage, which causes less hypertrophy. But you can certainly say uh, about it like, oh, I'm just so generally tired, it's hard to train my chest. No, your chest is going to be the limiting factor in that. But if you do 10 sets of back and then five sets of chest after, you're so tired from back, you may not be able to tax your chest specifically as much uh, because of that local systemic fatigue ratio. So those are sort of the eight theoretical constraints. Um, uh, and I think that it's very hard in a real world program to push a lot of those. What I think happens, so I think up to like, uh, for, for many muscles, uh, five or six days a week, I think none of these constraints are seriously pushed. I think for some muscles, they start to be pushed at three or four, uh, sessions, uh, per week, uh, maybe like quads, hamstrings, things like that. Um, but I think the primary way you run into these problems, and this is something that I'm sure Eric can, can be mowing alongside me, is the frequency for its own sake approach of training, in which you tell yourself, I have to train every muscle six times a week, like with its own specific exercises targeted directly. If you start doing that, you're going to run into some of these problems for some of the muscles. And then someone can come in and say, like, I know you're training everything seven times a week, but isn't some of that training real dog shit? And you're like, yeah, but I got to train seven times a week. And then someone's like, what if you train four times a week for all of your individual muscles? But then the quality of the training for each one of those sessions was super great. And you could say, well, that would be like roughly the same amount of hypertrophy or maybe just a little bit more. If it's just a little more, that's super great. But even if it's roughly the same, it's sometimes more pleasant to be able to focus a little bit more on a muscle group rather than having this task when you show up of I have to do 10 exercises because there's 10 distinct sort of body parts. So that's my, my shooting. 
Hey guys, sorry, just a short interruption. Mainly doing this because people have been asking me a lot in private messages on Instagram and Facebook and email whether I'm doing online coaching and the answer is actually yes. Maybe I've been doing a bad job promoting this so far, but in each video description, if you go to the show notes, you will always see a Calendly link there where you can book a free call, where we can chat on a call for up to 45 minutes. We can talk about your goals, what you would like to achieve, and whether or not you and I are a good fit for a coach-client relationship and can effectively work together to achieve your goals in the most efficient way possible. So if that is something of interest to you, then you can check the show notes wherever you're listening or watching this. There will be a Calendly link where you can just book that free call and we can move forward from there. So that's all I had to say for now. Let's continue with the show. So Eric, uh, I I cannot uh, recite everything and you just heard it, so I don't need to luckily. But what do you think is like, I, I guess in general, the, um, the message here is that there might be some distinct benefits to hammering a muscle group in a given session a bit more and perhaps not undershooting the amount of volume you do in a given session for a muscle group because maybe there is a benefit to disrupting it a bit more in a given session, maybe some, because of mind-muscle connection reasons or set potentiation or things like that. And maybe there are some safety concerns with connective tissue and things like that. So what do you think about these points? I, I think there's in, in certain contexts, all the points are, are valid and good. Um, that said, I think the devil is really in the details with this stuff. And um, I used to speak more generally about this because it was only a few years ago, uh, read pre <laughs> um where I would be trying to talk bodybuilders into simply trying to train each muscle group twice per week. And then eventually, once that worked well, then the door was open and we could actually explore what might be an optimal frequency for their situation, volume needs, goals, et cetera. Um, in recent times, I've had to t uh, deal with people who, and I will give Menno credit here, largely do a poor job of interpreting what Menno was talking about. When um, I would say that Menno made some, you know, I, I've told him this, and I, I don't think he would take this offensively. I think he jumped on the high frequency, quote unquote, bandwagon. Not to say he was jumping on a bandwagon. I think he might he have been, that, you know, man. leading those horses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he built that bandwagon. Damn it. Um, I think he. Um, in general, Menno, uh, emphasizes data at a point that is probably earlier than I would. I tend to wait until we have, um, more for sure data, either a higher quality or an overwhelming quantity before I'm willing to, before I would make the kind of statements he would. And that's not to say he interprets research wrong, quote unquote. Um, it just means that we interpret research differently, which guess what? That's true of all of us, including myself and Mike. And early adopter. Yeah, he's. I, I guess you could say he's more of an early adopter. And I think um, there is a time and a place to be an early adopter. And I feel like training frequency, especially given kind of the cultural values that lifters have that, that Mike talked about and that I totally agree with, there's potential harm there. So I, I um, even though there was a time point where I was, you know, training full body and doing what Menno is advising, um, I wasn't saying everyone should do this or even this is a good idea uh, just because I knew it could be so readily misinterpreted. And case in point, you know, I ran into someone while I was in Australia in 2016 uh, touring there who was literally in the middle of a workout, stepped out of the missed part of the, um, the seminar we were giving. Uh, to do some squats uh, because he trains every day, doesn't miss training days. Um, and he does one of his, his quad movement every single day was a squat variation. Um, and I don't think this is what I think I know this guy personally. <laughs> oh, wow. So, and, and, Fuck, he specifically, I left out. <laughs> <laughs> and he specifically told me that he was having joint pain and, um, like, so he's, he's missing something he paid for furthering joint pain, uh, missing out on a social opportunity stating, I don't think I should be doing this. This isn't a good idea yet still doing it. Um, and of course this may have been changed, you know, three years ago. And I, I pretty bluntly said like, yeah, that's what happens when you squat every day. Like that's not a, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not a good idea, you know? So, um, I mean, there are certainly cases where you can like to, uh, for example, to, to Mike's point about, um, 
joint stress and, and training with a high frequency. I'm sure every Olympic lifter who heard this podcast would like cock their eyebrow and be like, what the hell are you talking about? I do the exercises that put you in extreme ra- end, end ranges of motion. And I do them 10, 10 times a week. However, they also don't perform the eccentric. It's not the failure. The, 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 the set volume is incredibly low. It's, we're, you know, a high rep set for an Olympic lifter is a triple on, on these movements. Um, and the nature of those movements is such that they're not slow, grindy reps. Um, so it is very context dependent. So anyway, getting back to what I'm saying, there was a time where I was like, hey, high frequency equals good because high frequency literally meant more than once per week. And now the conversation has changed that the schema everyone has in their mind is that high frequency is daily training. Uh, and I'm like, oh, okay, now we're actually talking about legit high frequency training. <laughs> so now I can't just say high frequency equals good. Um, and I even made a, an Instagram meme, I think yesterday, where uh, I was like, hey, here's what people think when I mean high frequency training. And that meme wouldn't have made sense, um, you know, a while ago because high frequency training would have been fat, you know, Lane Norton talking about doing strength on one day and hypertrophy on another in an upper lower fashion, for example. Um, so uh, the, the, what we are talking about is, is something that I think is what, is what I'm attempting to do as a quote unquote thought leader, as arrogant as it, feel, it feels to say that, <laughs> is, um, is to try to get people to think about frequency differently rather than in splits and programs and schemas kind of the way we do. But rather, like Mike was saying, is that frequency should be an emergent property of one's goals. So if I was to give a useful takeaway to someone, I would sit, sit down and go, all right, what, what training can I commit to? And typically, you're going to have someone who has restrictions that are not going to be less than their the volume that's appropriate for them. Or sometimes they do. And then if you are the person who has time constraints that prevent you from doing the amount of training that might be optimal, you need to look at, okay, what works better for my schedule and my mentality and my body doing a few very, very difficult sessions that have a lot of volume uh, and are probably training all your muscle groups or doing a bunch of little short ones. And generally I can say that the latter is a better option for someone who's time restrained. If you can find 45 minutes in a day, uh, 30 minutes, even sometimes, uh, getting to the gym, unless it's like a 30 minute drive, um, like for for six mini sessions per week uh, ends up being a much better option than trying to get in three crazy sessions where you do all your compounds together and you're just dead and you barely recover from the next one and then you get back in the hole. Um, and that was kind of one of my first exposures to this is an interesting way of taking the same volume and, and mitigating the level of fatigue I get. So when you have constraints, I think that that that's sometimes useful for a high frequency approach. So anyway, when I'm sitting down with someone, I'm like, hey, if you want to figure out the optimal training approach for you, one, what can you do realistically? How many times can you get to the gym? How many hours do you have? And then look at if you have an idea, what's an appropriate amount of work that I need to do to progress based on my goals? Um, and that's going to be different. And I find most people, unless they're a competitive bodybuilder or a competitive powerlifter, um, or competitive in a one specific sport, and there's more and more dual sport strength physique athletes out there these days, um, is going to have concurrent strength and hypertrophy goals. So then we simply write down, all right, what, what are the, the non-negotiable exercises we must do? Um, and if, if the goal is hypertrophy, that is none. There's no non-negotiable exercises. Uh, so that gives us a lot more um, ability to avoid some of the issues that Mike brought up with higher frequency training. Um, and if, but if someone is like, let's say you're an idiot and you decide you want to compete in strongman, uh, weightlifting and powerlifting in the same year while also maintaining uh, progress in bodybuilding, like that'd be the dumbest thing to do ever, by the way, just put it out there. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. I'm doing that. And it is very difficult, but then uh, you want to say it. <laughs> yeah. Then I have a bunch of non-negotiables. So I have to do a conventional deadlift. Um, it, once per week or not, not once per week, but at some point, because that is the only deadlift allowed in strongman. However, I'm way stronger sumo. So since I'm going to compete in powerlifting, I've got to do sumo. I've also got a squat. I've also got a bench. I also need to do a clean and jerk and a snatch. And then I typically need to carry something or pull something or, or drag something and then put something over my head. That's not a barbell as well. Uh, and then somehow make sure, and then, then I look at, okay, with the amount of volume at the relative intensities and the periodization strategy I'm following with these movements, 
what muscle groups is actually getting a decent stimulus? And then whatever's left, then I go, right, I've already crushed myself just by nature of my goals. So I need to take the lowest stress movements, both for joints and just global perception of fatigue and find a way to train them via bodybuilding exercises. So, you know, if, if it left over is, oh, I need to do some hamstring work. I'm not going to be like, yep, good mornings and RDLs, right? It's going to be standing single leg hamstring curl. If it's like, all right, well, I'm getting plenty of uh, anterior delt work, but I need some more rear delts. Let me do some behind the neck presses. Like that wouldn't be my first choice. It would be a, a, a rear delt pec deck, something like that. So uh, the, the extreme example I'm using is just to say that look at what are the non-negotiables in terms of movements, uh, because strength is a skill if you have strength goals. Uh, look at the non-negotiables of your life. Uh, as far as when and how long you can be in the gym and what equipment you have available and then look at, you know, what are necessarily like, do you have specific body parts that need more volume than others, uh, that tend to recover more poorly, that you have joint contraindications of certain movements for, and then figure out basically what are the things you have to do. And then that applies constraints and then you can kind of shake everything else out. And in general, if you get over certain thresholds of volume, per session, that's when it should start, quote unquote, spilling into other days, when it make more sense to split it up. Uh, like, like, for example, nothing wrong, like Mike said, doing 10 sets for a muscle group in a session, unless there is for you. Like, like for me, um, certain muscle groups or certain movements, the, the, the quality really goes down after, say, four, five, six sets. Um, and I also, I don't know if it's, I'm, I'm, Maybe I do more warm sets than most, or maybe I have a, just a good mind-muscle connection. I get a great pump uh, on my first set of curls or flies or whatever. Um, I think maybe maybe I train it closer to failure because I do fewer sets per, per session. Um, but I haven't... Well, I understand Mike's rationale, and that may be something that someone struggles with early on, getting a pump or a good mind-muscle connection or being warmed up. Um, I haven't personally experienced that and people who have a lot of experience with training full body ish, maybe it's cause they're just setting it up. Right. Uh, that's not something that I have seen be a challenge. Um, maybe it is if they come from a lower frequency background first. Uh, but I think like with anything, once you try something, uh, you kind of figure out what are some of those more qualitative aspects that we can't speak generally about that, that solve those quote unquote problems. Um, so, yeah. And another interesting thing is um, when you take a higher frequency approach, uh, you just don't find you get as much DOMS. Um, and when you do get DOMS, it tells you something like, oh, wow. Okay. That, that really is, is a movement that kind of independent of volume, because my volume is necessarily low with a high frequency approach, really beats me up. And therefore, I should think about where I put that, what I do the next day, where my off days are placed. And even if this is a movement that I should be doing. It might be a non-negotiable and you got to figure out where you take your off days, what you do the day after, what you do the day before. Um, or it might be something that you're just doing because uh, Dorian Yates told me I had to and you're a bodybuilder and it's like, well, you don't have to. Anything that puts tension on a muscle you can use and you can probably find a version that doesn't beat you up as much. Um, also, joint pain emerges very obviously. Like um, if, if your joint pain doesn't resolve or aches or whatever very quickly. Uh, then, then that's probably something that's going to get cumulatively worse. Um, so you need to find out different options. So I, I find the, even if you don't find landing on a high frequency split is the best for you, it's a really good learning opportunity. Like I didn't actually start doing five day full body quote unquote, uh, training until I had actually experimented, uh, with upper, lower and different body part variations that, that took me from a two to five to four times per week, uh, frequency of each body part being trained. And I have trained body part splits. I've trained traditional full body splits uh, where you train everything, um, instead of just going, right, I don't have res restrictions. So I think the best way to take a high frequency approach is to simply not put restrictions on what you're allowed to train on any given day, and then figure out what emerges from that based on your needs and the constraints of your life. And that will sometimes, but not always, emerge as a full body-ish approach. But for example, there, there's a day in my five day per week split where I don't directly train quads. And that's okay, because I'm still training quads four times a week. And there's no reason why that wouldn't be okay, you know? Um, but there's nothing that says that once I've decided to try the quote unquote high frequency experiment, that therefore 
every muscle group has to get trained every day. Like why? We've already established if you're hitting it at least twice per week, you're probably in the ballpark of optimal. So it's kind of, um, that that's the main thing I want people to have a paradigm shift in thinking about is to not get locked into uh, frequencies and splits and movement uh, requirements because that's where people really mess up this whole low or high frequency thing. Eric, just for one second, I want to turn back to you just to clarify a couple of things before I give give it back to Mike. Um, do you think, and maybe I should clarify that I have a slight bias towards higher training frequencies, not because of any kind of muscle protein synthesis data or anything like that. It's mainly because there are just certain body parts that I just don't enjoy training that much. But if I can split them up into very short sessions and I can just do like two, three sets in a given session, then I can be motivated to train them with the volume that Hmm. I found them to be effective. For example, quads, if I had to do let's say four sets of squats and then four sets of leg presses in the same session, I would probably always just rationalize myself into not needing as much volume for my quads (laughs) because I would just find that to be a drag. So full disclosure, I train my quads six days a week. I know, I know. I'm being smart with that though, with exercise rotations and selection. Um, Do you think that um, doing that might be a bad idea because of connective tissue overuse or is that more so a risk of like squatting every day and exercise specific overuse and then the second thing off of that is you kind of touched on this but just to clarify do you think there is such a thing as too little stimulation in one given session like do you think that maybe i don't know one or two sets in a single session might just not be enough to really move the needle and to kind of tell the muscles that hey it is time to grow because you're being disrupted. Uh, what do you think? Good questions. So the, the, the first question of um, are there issues that you could be running into with uh, training quad six days a week? Or um, I, I would say only if there are. And most of the time that's going to be movement dependent, um, quality of form dependent. And then in that context, uh, volume and intensity dependent. So like if you have bad hips. Uh, and when you squat below parallel, you get SI joint pain. Uh, and you do that with a high volume and near failure. And that's when your form breaks down and exacerbates that hip issue. You will very quickly not be able to squat six days per week. Um, and you might get injured before you, you're able to make that qualitative change. So I think, uh, a hundred percent, I'll give you a personal example. Um, I get, uh, if I do low bar squats and I squat to meet depth, Um, there is SI joint pain, IT band pain on my right side, uh, and hip pain that takes about three or four days to resolve. Even if I do a single, like if I work up to a a single at a five RPE with the minimum number of warm-up sets, that that's just the way it is for me. I can front squat pretty much any day and every day, uh, unless I back squatted recently and that messed me up, right? Um, hack squats to some degree, depending on, on, on the sled, totally fine like a front squat or it gives me a little bit of knee pain because not every hack squat is the same. Um, Leg presses, dude, just like you, they give me um, a really high qualitative level of effort. Like you think like a leg press should be either easier than a squat, but for me, like I feel like my head's going to explode. Even when I'm doing, like when when I work with a new leg press, something that ends up becoming my 20 rep max when I do it for eight feels like an eight rep max the first time. And I could keep pushing through, but then it feels like I've somehow managed to do 12 more reps in RPE 10. Um, and I do think that we want to avoid really large, uh, amounts of subjective difficulty and fatigue and stress early in a session. Cause I think it can impact the rest of that session. And there is data to show that uh, high levels of peripheral fatigue or a huge amount of work done, uh, metabolic expenditure done early on um, can create a feedback loop to then create central inhibition, which then makes it just so you can't effectively train no matter what you do for at least a, a certain amount of time. Um, and I think RPE has been shown to be linked to that. So I think you want to find a way to, to make sure that most of the fatigue you're experiencing, if your goal is hypertrophy, is peripheral, not central. So movements that just have a really, really high subjective level of effort for you, you want to think about where you put those. Um, like it's unfortunate that when I work up to a single at an eight on conventional deadlift, I'm getting really, really low level of stimulus for hypertrophy. But it 
and, and very little in energy expenditure and all of the things that are objective measures of output. But my subjective RPE is really high globally, you know. So where I put that single on a conventional deadlift, I have to be very picky and choosy. And it kind of ruins the rest of the session if I if the goal was to do a high volume hypertrophy session. If I'm going to do a loaded carry and an overhead press, that's fine. And that becomes my strongman day and that's all I do. Um, but thinking about it from that perspective. So I would say, yeah, certain uh, if you have a body part that's and quads a great example, like if squats leg presses and hack squats, and let's say leg extensions, which for me give an insane level of pain that that even uh, when I'm five reps from failure makes me want to stop, you know, that's not ideal, right? So there's not a good quad movement for, for in that scenario um, that, that, that has a relatively low fatigue amount for the amount of stimulus you get. So it makes sense to split that up for sure. So I think you're probably doing it better than the other option. But for someone else, it might be the exact opposite. Like, for example, I know people who don't feel anything on leg extensions and don't feel like they get them any, any growth. So I don't know if that has to do with, you know, femur length and blood flow occlusion and how far you sit up or lean back or, or whatever. Um, but there are definitely individual differences. So that was a really long answer to your first question. Um, the second question you had was, is there a minimum uh, threshold for getting a stimulus. And I just can't see any way that that would be the case or why, or any rationale from an evolutionary perspective. In fact, I can see the exact opposite. Um, you know, like traditionally, like anaerobic type stuff, which everything we're talking about falls into, even though we talk about, you know, high rep or low rep, uh, typically from a survival perspective, that's only going to occur for as long as it needs to occur. Like, you know, fights are really short in the real world. They don't have rounds, you know, uh, running from a, a cheetah, you either get killed or you get away and you probably climb a tree, you know, or something like that, you know, like, um, anaerobic efforts are meant to be short lived and very high intensity. And you would need to, from a survival perspective, be able to adapt to that. And more so from less of a, a weird speculative, uh, pretending to be an evolutionary biologist perspective, when you look at data on which set is the most effective, you get something like 60% of the hypertrophy out of a five rep or a five set, um, five sets on an exercise out of the first set. The diminishing returns happen as you do more sets. Um, the first set, especially if it's taken to failure, is far and away the biggest efficiency one you'll gain. Um, and like if you were to take a beginner especially and have them just do one set per week to failure on each muscle group, they would get the vast majority of gains possible. Um, and it's not that you are fundamentally different when you are, are experienced. It's just that the the rate of progress you can expect is much lower. And you have to do things that are inefficient just to gain any little ground. But there's not a fundamental difference. That first set to failure is still uh, the most effective one. So, yeah, that, that's kind of my answer there. Is there's, there's no reason to believe, uh, in fact, there's contrary evidence that there would be a minimum threshold for... Uh, for, for, for like the amount you have to do. I do think there's probably a minimum intensity threshold and then volume is kind of this dial, but really it's about how do you distribute it, uh, over, over time. And, uh, if you were taking an approach, one thing I don't think that mixes well is training really, really submaximally, uh, and then doing a high frequency, low volume approach. Like I think, for example, some of the easier Shiko setups are great for building your skill with the lifts. But the average bodybuilder with even a, a normal training background, they're going to feel like it's hard and I'm doing a lot, but they're actually not, they're, they'll probably get smaller. That was my experience with running some of the Shiko templates when I came from a bodybuilding background is I started to, subject, I, I, I noticed that my, that my upper body especially was shrinking, even though I was doing more total sets, um, more bench work, but it was such a time intensive thing and so many warm up sets and setting up, but doing a bunch of triples at 75% on bench is not going to do a whole heck of a lot for, for hyper. It'll do something, um, but it'll give me a lot of time to get better at the lifts and I will get stronger, but I might be actually having my pecs slowly shrink over time uh, compared to what I was doing previously. Perfect. Uh, Mike, so what would be your rebuttal to the, uh, there isn't the real reason to uh, believe that you should need a certain amount of minimum set number per session to elicit uh, an adaptive response hypertrophy wise mm. what do you think two questions so the, on the evolutionary front i can also hypothesize that adaptations to the musculoskeletal system are very uh, metabolically expensive 
and need a very good reason to occur, especially once decent reasons have already been exhausted. So we can think um, if you're um, really good at, if you really suck at Spanish, any amount of spoken Spanish makes you better. Uh, if you are a fluent Spanish speaker, to become a literary master in Spanish, simply reading Facebook posts will not get you there, and, and there is no amount of Facebook post reading that will get you there. You have to do a qualitatively different, more difficult kind of uh, training, so to speak. So with the evolutionary perspective we could take, I think uh, Eric's may very well be correct, but um, maybe uh, intermediates and advanced lifters need much greater challenge than just something because the body has already thoroughly adapted to just something and it may not budge uh, furthermore after that. Uh, so that's my thinking on the evolutionary side. Um, on the research driven side, the percent of your hypertrophy you get a uh, fraction percent from the first set is research to my knowledge on beginners and early intermediates. Very early to me, so you look at trained populations in science, and those are people that have quote unquote trained for two years, which would be really good fuck all. Um, and that uh, I think the you know fraction of total hypertrophy you get from your first set probably tends to decline as you get more and more experienced um, and more advanced. So I think you need more sets to move the needle uh, significantly. Um, I think that curve will probably tend to smooth out. Not entirely. I think the first set is still probably the most hypertrophic uh, if compared individually to all other sets, but you may get to double or triple the hypertrophy uh, from adding six or eight sets uh, than just doing one set or something like that, which is to say that there is a big effect there. And in addition to that, um, the line of thinking that says, you know, your first set is really the most effective anyway, is exactly the same line of thinking that could be accurately applied to training frequency. So you know, the thinking usually goes, well, if your first set is the most effective, why don't we train six times a week and get the most effective thing six times a week? My retort to that would be, uh, if you look at the literature on training frequency, you train once a week, it gives you 60% of the gains you would ever get from training six times per week. So why don't we train twice a week with five sets each time and not bother with one set you know, per session six times a week or something like that? So I think uh, the same kind of critique you could apply to per session volumes applies to frequency as well, which leaves us maybe not at an impasse, but certainly a, uh, an interesting thought experiment. Uh, I think for the most part, uh, the minimum effective volume per session for most people is very small. I think it can be as small as one set for most people. I think for some people that are very advanced uh, with body muscle groups that are a little bit recalcitrant to growth, I think it might be two or three sets per session, um, and anything shy of that uh, acts a little bit more as a warm-up slash show-off set than it does as something that stimulates hypertrophy enough or for long enough for it to, to result in net protein synthesis over the course of the week. Um, but I think all of that, that mostly ends up in the wash if, uh, as I mentioned earlier, your frequency and your per-session volume play into one another. So if you're interested in training with two sets per session, I think that's fine as long as you train every day, <laughs> right? Because so, you know, mathematically that results in 12 working sets per week, which tends to be for advanced athletes, oftentimes what I have observed is their minimum effective volumes. Anything much less than 10 sets per week probably doesn't get jacked, people much more jacked. Um, but you know, on the other hand, if you want to train you know, with six sets per session, then training twice a week is probably a good way to get to, to where you want to go because the blip of hypertrophy from that session is higher, but you get fewer blips. So I think it largely cancels out. Although, um, so, so, I, so I don't, I don't think, I think it's very difficult to find a true place at which you get no hypertrophy from a single session. I think you probably get some, although the time course could be several hours and then you go back to neutral. You could have sort of trained again if it was just one set. What I think is the more pertinent critique is there may be a, uh, a, a not one set result to the question of where the U-shaped curve peaks for the session by frequency paradigm, right? And in, in, if I had to take a guess at it, the million dollar question, I would say for advanced athletes, uh, that occurs between two and six sets per session uh, is where uh, optimal hypertrophy occurs, even if you align it exactly to frequency. That is to say, for people who lift 
twice, two sets per session per muscle group, they get a higher frequency. People who lift six sets per session per muscle group get a lower frequency. I think the optimal is probably somewhere. I'd be very surprised if you can get the best possible program, and maybe not very surprised, mildly surprised, tickled, you could say, if um, <laughs> been used, I would have had a mustache, I would be ruffling through it and adjusting my monocle. Um, something Eric does every day, by the way, when he wakes up with mustache <laughs> and monocle, I might add. Um, so, I mean, it, so if, if one set per session was, you could structure it and basically train, do two a days every day, I would be a little bit interested in, in if that turned out to be optimal. I would also be very interested if it turned out to be that, you know, you could get the best possible hypertrophy results from, you know, 10 sets per session, three times a week or something like that. I think between two and six sets per session, because I didn't get a chance and I'm sure I'll do this another time, is the downsides of too many sets per session per muscle group are distinct. And in my view, they start they start uh, positioning themselves after about four or five sets per, per muscle group per session. And after six to eight sets, they become very prominent. I never really know what people are doing when they train 12 sets of quads per session, for example, because after about eight sets, I'm useless and full of garbage and nothing happens good to my quads anymore. It's just a fun way to accumulate systemic fatigue at that point. Um, so I think that at the very extreme, there's a downside to training with fewer than two sets per session. And at the very extreme, on the other end, maybe more than 10 sets per session is not optimal, though still effective. I think the optimality is if I had to take a guess from all the constraints that I mentioned and stuff that I didn't, two to six sets, two to six working sets per session. And also I will add, just from a practical perspective, uh, and maybe Eric can talk about this some more because uh, uh, he already gave the example of like he trains quads four times a week, even though he trains five times a week total. You don't really get out of bed for one fucking work set. And you know, for the love of God, as, if we understand frequency as we currently do, that the results are rather equivalent between, you know, three, four, five sessions per week. Like, you know, if you're going to train chest, you might as well fucking hammer it. Oh, and that, hammer it is an exaggeration. You're going to do one set of chest, you might as well do two, two or three, right? It, it's always curious to me, people like, here's my set of biceps for the day. And it's like, you know, you walked over, you warmed up on this bicep cable thing. And, and there's also something to be said for the downside of a, a program with a lot of complexity and a lot of exercise number. I don't know if you guys can, uh, can chime in on that, but, you know, if you have 10 different exercises, that can itself be psychologically daunting. They're like, can't I just fucking do four fucking exercises and hit most of my body and then come in the next day and do four other exercises and hit the other part of my body? I think there's something to be said for that. So I'm always, you know, if, if you have, uh, I'll put you this way, I'm not, this is not dogmatic, not religious. It's just an average first look for me. If someone has a program designed where when they train a specific muscle, they don't train it between two and six, or let's put this way, at least two sets per session. Um, I'm curious to try to consolidate it so that they maybe do fewer sessions, but do uh, two to four, at least in the beginning of their muscle cycle. sets per session. Yeah, and, and, and I think that value you mentioned, the two to six sets, is actually fairly practical because in practice, most people train once a day. Um, so if someone was to do just one set for a muscle group, even if they were to train seven days a week, most intermediate plus lifters don't really grow from seven sets a week. So yeah, grow very if slow. To, yeah, if someone was to do only two sets, that's you know that will only amount to fourteen sets, even if they train seven days a week. So that kind of washes out the disagreement there. And also, I, I, if if you don't mind me chiming in, I um I do, Eric. I really fucking do. Well, then you can just suck it. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> the I, I, I purely wanted to just say that I, I, uh, like I'm not advocating for a single set per workout uh, because like you said, that would to get to the volumes that we know are appropriate for hypertrophy, the vast, for the vast majority of people that would require training more than once a day, which why, you know, like I just, um, and, and I, I agree that there might be, uh, w whether there is a minimum number of set threshold to elicit an adaptation uh, is a different question than does it make sense to try to game the system to then have, you know, one set as frequently as possible. Because um, I, 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 don't, I don't think you should do that. I think that's silly. Like, I, I, I just don't see from a physiological perspective, um, I don't think there's a, a true minimum threshold for volume. I mean, there actually has to be because we exist in space and time. 
So as soon as you do a set, it can't just be intensity that, that, that is a volume, right? There is some time spent contracting, right? <laughs> you know, so, um, we can't truly separate volume, intensity, and frequency because we exist in, you know, uh, uh, a universe with time, but not so, all of us do, Eric. <laughs> this is true. You, you, you are uh, you're so big. You've gotten so massive. You exist across all time and space. Um, so, so kudos to your hypertrophy breaking yeah. laws of physics. Your quantum hypertrophy. Um, so, w- you know what I think is really interesting, though, and I, I, uh, I don't want to derail the conversation too much, is using very, very low volume, highly specific work for someone with concurrent strength and hypertrophy goals. So I totally agree that if your goal is hypertrophy and nothing else, you don't wake up and go to the gym to do one working set. That it doesn't make sense for, it would take some very strangely constructed and way too much time spent thinking about it, a uh, way to construct a microcycle that made sense and wasn't suboptimal to allow you to do that on any given day for a muscle group, right? If you weren't like rehabbing from an injury and slowly getting more graded exposure. I just can't think of any scenario where you do one set of bicep curls in one day and no back work or lat pull downs, you know, um, maybe if you'd already done, you know, like chins and rows and you have a low volume necessity for your biceps, you just do one set of curls afterwards just to get to your weekly, you know, amount maybe, but I'm, I'm reaching. However, um, I do get up to do one working set multiple times per week because the amount of strength that you can develop and skill development you can get from working up to one semi-heavy single is way disproportionate uh, to the amount that you get from doing a lot of volume of strength work. And the relationship between intensity and strength development is much stronger than the relationship between volume and strength development. And now we've actually seen a number of studies where a Bulgarian-esque approach uh, where powerlifters working up to just doing a single on the lifts one to three times per week do nearly as well, maybe not as consistently as well, which makes sense if you think about it, um, compared to a fully periodized approach. Is that best for long term? Is it best to do all the time? No. But let's say you do have the concurrent goals of getting good at the clean and jerk, uh, the snatch, uh, log press, conventional deadlift, uh, squat bench and deadlift, uh, and you also want to get bigger and you have, you know, a job or five in some cases, it would make a whole hell of a lot of sense to come in and just work up to a single on a squat a couple of times per week and then choose other movements to get your quad growth because you're effectively able to, to maximize certain pathways to strength and then find the least stressful way to then get hypertrophy. So when I've worked with people who have concurrent strength and hypertrophy goals uh, or powerlifters who are also bodybuilders or people with, with multiple strength sports, High frequency, low volume, high intensity uh, work, highly specific work on the main lifts and then general work besides that is a really, really almost cheat code level, in my opinion, method of programming uh, that allows you to conserve time and get the best of both worlds. So just to put that out there. Yeah. Um, so, guys, I'm, I'm fully aware that we are at one hour, th- oh, shit, 13 minutes on lucky number, but um, I don't at all plan on being abusive of your time. Um but if you're good with time, I would have one last point that I would bring up, but I don't want to open up a huge can of worms, which are, is going to keep us here for a whole bunch more time. So how are you guys doing on time? I'm fine with it. Mike? Yeah, good. Sweet. So uh, the, the last thing um, that I would want to bring up, and this might be something which could make us differ a little bit on the topic, is... Um... Hey, guys, just a second. Are you enjoying this podcast? If so, I'd really appreciate you dropping a five-star rating on the Sustainable Self-Development Podcast on iTunes. That will help me to grow this podcast, rank higher on the platform, and get more high-quality guests over time, which is a win-win for everybody. So if you could do this little bit of favor for me, I'll owe you one. Thanks a lot, guys, and let's continue. I heard you, Mike, mention a number of times, and I don't exactly know what your stance is on this, but... More or less, I know because I listen to a lot of the stuff that you put out and read a lot of the stuff you put out is that um, muscle soreness uh, is something that is not causative of muscle growth per se. It's not the case that you have to be sore to grow or it's not certainly not the case that you have to be violently sore to grow. Uh, But one thing that Eric mentioned is that with high frequency training and once you get accustomed to hitting a muscle group pretty frequently, 
um, you don't really get DOMs anymore. And I will just say, by the way, this is something I've, I've always been very skeptical of the relationship between muscle growth and soreness, purely based on anecdotal experience, because the amount of variation I've seen between people on that is just enormous. Like some people just keep getting sore if they up the volume, if they up the intensity, if they progress. People like myself, once I am accustomed to a given movement, I can keep adding up the volume I can keep like at one point I literally worked up to like 42 sets of chest work and and back work and those were like legit one rep away from failure sets and I never got sore anymore because I was used to the movements but if I added in some glute kickbacks or something which I don't really do I would get probably sore in my glutes for the first few workouts so um, that's my skepticism there but I know you have a different stance so how do you think this could factor in in uh, you know influencing how much muscle growth you're getting out of your uh, program so uh, one thing i'll say is muscle soreness is still rather mysterious oh. and at this stage we uh there's a lot of new end <laughs> up there. um so we're not really so sure we're not super sure what's going on with muscle soreness um, so any very definitive statements should automatically arise uh, a lot of suspicion Another fact is that soreness exists on a spectrum. So from a perceived weakness and sort of flimsiness of the muscle with a very low volume exposure to let's say something you're used to doing all the way to soreness that uh, is very minimal and lasts a 24 hour cycle and all the way to soreness that lasts two days, three days, four days, five days, six days and onward. So I don't think it's, um, Immediately apparent, I would make a distinction between DOMs and not DOMs. I think if you talk to someone who squats four times a week or does legs four times a week, they may say, you know, I don't get like DOMs, DOMs, but the day, the evening of and the day after I do quads, I definitely in some kind of sort of uh, soreness is some, somewhat apparent or some damage has been done. And uh, I think that has to be factored in as so we could. If we don't do this, we could come to a hilarious conclusion that training quads six times a week makes you feel just fine and fucking dandy because it's no more doms, right? And people who train quads six days a week the volume equated to what they would train if they did twice a week and not doms are in fucking brutal agony at all goddamn times. <laughs> um, so your muscles always feel a little weak. They always feel a little fucked up. And even sometimes you get a little uh, hint of doms uh, everywhere. So once we start looking at Soreness is a spectrum, and I think uh, muscle soreness is very closely related to muscle damage. Um, I think the evidence directly from the laboratory points to that. Um, I know some other folks, specifically Mana Hanselmans, have seen things differently. I would argue heavily against that. It's, it's wildly wrong. Um, so the question really becomes not as much one of uh, DOMS, is it good or bad, but of what is the relationship between muscle damage and muscle growth. So we know a couple of things for sure. If you elicit no damage, you're almost guaranteed no growth because then no stimulus occurred. Every robust stimulus causes damage as a byproduct, every single one, uh, bar none. Um, now, it's not to say that damage causes growth. It could be completely correlative, though we don't know that. We, we might, there might be some causative mechanisms in play. Um, we know that some damage is necessary simply as a byproduct of some level of effort. The next thing we know, also pretty certainly, is that an excessive amount of damage almost certainly competes with hypertrophic processes. We can envision that a recovery adaptation potential is a pool of cellular resources, and uh, recovery and adaptation both get dipped out of that pool. So if you semi-truck yourself in the gym and have doms that you can't walk, or <laughs> I'll say you can't even masturbate, which is the worst possible thing that could happen, right? Uh, that level of doms. Um, so if you get crazy, crazy doms that last a week, it is a, it's very, very possible that you could have simply used almost all or all or more than all of your recovery adaptive potential to just get rid of the heal, the damage that has occurred, uh, not just the primary damage of the exposure itself, but the secondary immune infiltration damage by which doms really happens, then you're in uh, a lot of trouble as far as getting growth. And I think that's probably the number one reason why much more than 10 sets per session seems to, in multiple studies now, not cause net gains or cause poor net gains, 
because you're just fucking yourself up so much that you're essentially giving yourself a car accident level of exposure every time, just barely heal. So the question there is, uh, I think there's some, so the, the extremes we can rule out, never causing damage, untenable uh, for hypertrophy, causing too much damage, bad idea. I think there are some really interesting uh, questions that I don't know the answers to in that middle ground. For example, is there an advantage to being to doing just as much work as possible before you notice any degree of delayed onset soreness? And is that maximum hypertrophy route? Possibly. Or is the middle ground approach good where getting sore for one or two days is sort of the equivalent of the, the best work to damage ratio that gets you the highest level of total hypertrophy? Maybe. Or is the rule simply that as long as you don't get super crazy sore and you train when you have recovered, right, as long as you're not having overlapping soreness all the time, maybe that's the ticket to the best growth. I'm skeptical of that last option. Um, I'm not skeptical of the first two, uh, and I tend to recently be of the opinion that if you're training and you're not getting sore, I think in many cases for hypertrophy, the answer is train more. And so long as you're not getting sore, you're probably going to grow more, right? Um, that's, that's my sort of default assumption. Is there a level of soreness which is even better than that, that correlates to essentially, is there a level of per session volume? that is even greater hypertrophic stimulus on that balance. Maybe, maybe not. There's some interesting functional overreaching ideas. Uh, and, and also the fact that beginners, when you uh, expose them to varying set conditions, uh, you know, low volume, intermediate volume, high volume, the high volume groups almost always do the best if you have a normal frequency, like two days a week, three days a week. And those groups get sore than all the other groups in, in actual real world human subjects. Like you talk about the group that does 15 sets of quads Per session versus the one that does five, the five group doesn't get sore at all after a few weeks. The 15 set group probably gets sore the entire fucking time. And the 10 set group maybe gets sore halfway through the study and then a little less and a little less. The 15 set group does grow more, right? In, 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 in most of these studies in the short term, right? So if we're going to say, well, any amount of soreness, anytime you get sore, it's definitely net negative. I'd be very skeptical of that, right? So, but I think there's that gray area there. We don't, don't exactly know the answers. But what, what I will say for sure, and I'll just shut the fuck up after this is, if you are progressing in your strength levels over time, especially mesocycle to mesocycle, and you have noticed that you don't get sore, um, you know, into the very high volume levels, and you say, well, there's no way adding volume from here will make me grow, I would lead you to question that assumption. Because you might be one of these quote unquote lucky assholes whose maximum recovery volume is 70 sets per week. It's happened before. Uh, the Schoenfeld study and the study of re replicating uh, from Brazil both showed that hypertrophy was higher at 45 sets per week than it was at 30. So, uh, Abel, you particularly, I'm speaking to in this occasion, um, you said you worked up to 40 sets of chest and back. Fucking go for more. Now, if you start to experience performance loss and weakness, now that's not a good thing. That's not going to lead you to growth. But if you're still performing well, more sets probably causes more hypertrophy to the point where you're not performing well or debilitated by sports. So that's, that's what I'll say. Yeah. Um, once I'm uh, not more interested in uh, cauliflower rice than my girlfriend when she's naked, I will try it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's the best way to put dieting ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well said. Uh, so, Eric, um, what your thoughts on uh, what Mike just said? Yeah, I think first I'm going to start with steel manning. Um, I think... In the right uh, system, and what I mean system from like a coach's perspective, uh, when they set up training in a certain way, uh, and there are certain variables held constant um, in a certain population, delayed onset muscle soreness can be a useful metric. Like for example, if you are generally using low to moderate frequencies, I'd say anything of training each muscle group three times per week or less. Uh, and if you are training with um, at least moderate volumes and training reasonably close to failure, I think uh, kind of the, the Goldilocks zone of, of soreness makes a lot of sense. Um, and that anecdote is valid in those, in those contexts. And that probably indicates that we're looking at a correlatory variable, not a causative variable. Because um, I, I will give a different example where that totally falls apart anecdotally. Like... 
Uh, so for many, many years, I have spent uh, and changed since, you know, like the, the Henselman constructed bandwagon we talked about. Um, but from basically until 2015, I was getting people to go from one times per week to higher frequencies um, and across the board, on average, seeing increases in hypertrophy and decreases in soreness. So, you know, either they were all way, doing way too, way too much and getting too sore or simply that we're looking at a, a correlating variable, not, not causative. That's point one. Point two, I think is really important that, and Mike made this point, uh, that DOMS is not the same thing as muscle damage. And muscle damage always occurs, but it doesn't always cause DOMS. So we know that you can get robust hypertrophy uh, in the absence of detectable muscle damage by indirect measures. Um, but if you were to do a direct measure and biopsy somebody, you would indefinitely see muscle damage. So it's almost like we can't separate muscle damage from hypertrophy, or like Mike said, there wouldn't be overload. The question is to what degree can you detect it, and then does that tell us anything? And I do also agree um, that there is a relationship between DOMS and muscle damage. However, this is, means that there's a correlation between them, and that's been shown repeatedly. I would agree. Uh, Mike said he strongly disagrees with Minnow that um, one doesn't predict the other. And I think we're largely talking about correlational studies, but there's a weakness to correlations. They don't, that, that just means that they go in the same direction, and it might be a reasonably strong direction, but it doesn't necessarily mean there's agreement. So this is a statistical point, but you need like a bland Altman uh, analysis and then to create some regressions to actually see if we could use ratings of DOMS to predict muscle soreness. Uh, and I actually don't think we'd be able to do that unless you... you to predict muscle damage? Correct. Like if we needed DOMS to predict the actual objective level of muscle, then we don't have data on that. Like we'd have to... We, I think Menno cites the study where that's exactly what they did. And he says it's not evidence for it, but if you read the study, there's, there's very good evidence for it. Well, I could be completely full of garbage that someone has... Maybe, maybe a lab has got DOMS ratings, uh, done biopsies, and then used, uh, you know, levels of agreement in addition to correlations to predict muscle damage from DOMS. And that may be the case. I could be wrong. Um, I know if that has been done, it's not, it's certainly not a, a whole lot of data. It may be a study because it's not something that I've seen when I've looked at, at this research. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we can only study DOMS in the context of the programs we put people on as well. So I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of DOMS damage correlation data in high frequency training. It's typically going to be in no more than three times per week training frequency per muscle group because 99% of studies on people in resistance training literature are two or three times per week training studies, you know, uh, and they're also short term uh, and the repeated bout effect plays out over time and with exposures. So if you take someone who's a well-trained person who's been training with a high frequency I think you're going to have a very, very low predictive power of uh, DOMS telling you much. Um, if, Isn't that because they're not getting DOMS yet? Exactly. Exactly my point. But, but if they double their training volume per session, they double their damage and probably have DOMS now. For a while. But 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 then, then is it useful? Like like my, my point is, is, though, is that if I take someone uh, and they start to grow better by me increasing the frequency and the DOMS gets less... In that context, DOMS was not at all useful to predict hypertrophy. I think it just depends on how you look at DOMS. If you look at it as a U-shaped curve, depending on where you put the, the U or the peak of the curve, it can be very useful. Like in the, in the hypothesis that too much DOMS is bad, the zero DOMS, what maximum work of it gets you zero DOMS is the best, and also bad is no work at all. I think that using DOMS to, to titrate training volumes might be effective. So basically, you take a high-frequency split, you start to ramp up volume slowly, incrementally, until and unless you know, the folks you're training experience DOMS. And when they start to experience DOMS, you may have a hint that you're doing so much training volume that it becomes deleterious to their gains. But until you reach DOMS, maybe the hypothesis is that, well, all is, all is good, and they continue to have that really excellent growth without DOMS. Yeah, I mean, that that's an interesting hypothesis. Um, and this, this kind of goes back to where I, I stated how I differ from Menno and that I wouldn't be... Uh, willing to make a uh, statement without evidence to, or, or interpret the evidence in the same way. Like right now, a second ago, we were arguing over whether or not um, DOMS is a good predictor of damage. But that's one step removed from is 
DOMS, a good predictor of damage, which is then a good predictor of hypertrophy. And we have zero data showing any relationship um, between DOMS and hypertrophy. Uh, and if anything, we have data showing that you can only relate muscle protein synthesis um, to, to, to hypertrophy once you've corrected for the damage because uh, it's an interfering signal. And I, again, I, I'm not going to say, and therefore, all damage is bad because I think that's way too overreaching as well. And I think damage probably does have some integrated role with hypertrophy because it's part and parcel of overload. But I would feel completely uncomfortable telling people to uh, gauge the effectiveness of how much volume they're doing uh, with DOMS, considering there's zero data showing a relationship between hypertrophy and DOMS. That to me um, would be completely relying on anecdote and, and a, a hypothetical construct that without any actual underpinning. And again, I've seen the exact opposite where DOMS has decreased and hypertrophy has increased when, when I increase someone's frequency. So that it just, it just, uh, like, like I said, the steel man I started with is that if all else is equal and you're not on a high frequency and you increase volume and DOMS goes up, um, it'll probably go back down. I mean, it'll go down the next week anyway, because, because now you're kind of adapted to that volume and that that's the repeated bout effect, which it doesn't, you know, like, I don't think that that that's not the same. Your, your ability to repair damage more quickly is not the same as your ability to hypertrophy. Like regeneration and growth aren't the same thing, even though they share many pathways. So I, I, I can't, in the absence of any data that links DOMS to hypertrophy, recommend it as a tool to gauge hypertrophy personally. God damn it, guys, decide. Do, should I up my volume or not from 42? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Mike, your rebuttal to that? Uh, I think that we can use studies that weren't exactly designed to test specific hypotheses to infer uh, some po possible directions. Uh, and I think that if we do that and if we use our own personal coaching experience, we can make reasonable assumptions based on the totality of the understanding of the subject to guide ourselves into a direction we think is uh, more wise than not. Um, and to perhaps to guide others. And I think if we properly couch these hypotheses as hypotheses, we can do maybe a, a little more guidance than saying, because there is no direct study of the subject, we are not willing to make any sort of training direction whatsoever. So I'm of the opinion that if you get a very high degree of DOMS, which you're probably also having a very high degree of damage, I think that if you have a very high degree of damage, in most cases, you're probably not going to get your best growth results possible. There is direct research for that, uh, not for the other things that I just said, but there's certainly really good reasons to speculate. Um, and then on the other hand, if you are not getting any DOMS at all and you have a given frequency or a given volume, that uh, raising them is a potential way to increase hypertrophic outcomes. I'd say performance is number one for sure. Uh, but I will say that because soreness and performance are actually very tightly linked, um, it's a lot of the same. So for example, if you're still sore and you're about to go train chest, um, your performance on chest is probably going to be lower than it could have been. And thus a program that has overlapping soreness, like you train Mondays, you get sore chest, you train again Thursday, you get sore again, even though you're still sore, and then you sore again next Monday, so on and so forth. I think that sort of setup doesn't make any sense from a performance perspective, or the best kind of sense. And I think it also doesn't make any sense from a, what you would think soreness indicates damage and remodeling and so on and so forth. So I think that we can say that if you're getting crazy fucking sore, I think that may not be the best thing. And I think that uh, uh, if you are getting no soreness at all. Your performance is good. It is either stable or climbing. And you're asking yourself the question of, should I experiment with slowly, meticulously, carefully adding incremental small amounts of volume? Then I think the answer is biased just slightly towards yes than towards no. Uh, because clearly you are recovering in the sense that you are not uh, perceptively damaged. If your performance is good, you're recovering by the sports science definition that your performance is back to baseline. And then adding... Volume as far as adding number of hard sets is probably the you know number one correlate of hypertrophy is the number of hard sets that you do. Uh, so I think that leaves us with something to take away from the soreness idea. If someone comes to me and 
they say, hey, you know, like, here's my experience. What do you think I could do better? I train chest, my chest won't grow. And they bring up soreness. It's not something I would bring up first, but they say, you know, sore all the time. I'd say, you know, maybe try to reduce your per session volume a little bit so that you're not sore all the time. So you have a day or two between uh, bouts of soreness. I would predict that that would be good advice, that that would probably result in more hypertrophy than not. And a potentially really good way to do that is to increase training frequency because you reduce stops altogether and probably reduce a lot of needless damage and reduce the, almost the existence of the repeated bout effect because the repeated bout comes so soon that there's not like an involution of your ability to deal with muscle damage, right? Which I think really was delayed on some soreness really is, is it's sort of physiologically been so long since your body has done something that it's like, fuck this again, this is new, I'm getting sore again. Whereas if you train relatively frequently, your body retains some of the adaptations it has of dealing with that and can not have to piss away a shitload of some of the resource trying to recover you and heal you versus adapt, right? And then the other hand, if someone said to me, hey, you know, my pecs won't grow, and I'd say, you know, uh, and they'd say, you know, but I never get sore ever, not even remotely. And uh, it's sort of, regardless of what training frequency they're using, I'd say, you know, how is your performance? Like, it's good. I'm getting a little bit stronger. Well, sort of week to week, I would say, you know, maybe you can try to up the volume a little bit per session on average and see if you get bigger that way. Uh, I certainly wouldn't give that advice if they were like, listen, I mega fucking, and this is, this is really true. Sort of, I think it comes to a head where the uh, information, some people are of the opinion that the DOMS has nothing to do with anything. I think it's fucking wildly premature and borderline irresponsible. So for example, someone is doing a certain program and they're like, dude, I'm fucking sore all the time. I can never recover. I just have to keep hitting it. But I'm at like a volume where like most of the research says I should be recovering just fine. Should I raise my volume? And my answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, I think that, that's a fucking insane thing to say. And on the other hand, the other form of insanity is someone's doing relatively low volume, not getting sore or even sort of remote discomfort or performance loss in the muscle. And they say, hey, like, I don't want to increase my volume. I don't know. It could get hurt. I'd say, you know, it's probably a good idea to start walking into a little bit of a higher volume. You may find that things are good there and that you uh, have more than satisfactory results. Perfect. Um, Eric, uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? Or do you agree to disagree? I, well, I think we're, we're, we might have to agree to disagree, but the, um, I think, I think we're looking at here is like, we do need more data. Like I would love to see all of the, I think we have all the data we need, Eric. Yes. A hundred percent. I'm right. I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you that. We have more than enough data. <laughs> Bookworm. Yeah. We always need more data, which is, it's always a, a yeah. cop out, but a truth. Um, no, it's not for sure true, especially yeah. on this point, uh, mm. for sure. For real though. Like yep. this is one of those things where people ask me to muse, intellectually on DOMS and I'm like that in fact we need like a, an entire different line of research to find out exactly what the fuck's doing. What would be nice is if all of the studies where they assess uh, different volume comparisons also just asked about DOMS. Um, Bro, I'm telling you, I, brilliant. I do think you'd see two inverted U's um, but they whether or not those inverted U's had a relationship to one another and in what context and what the program the person did coming into it I think would influence that. So I think I think Mike and I are both saying, look, DOMS isn't causative for hypertrophy, but it might be useful uh, to, to predict it in some cases. I th- and it's very extremes, is what I would say. Maybe, and, and I think I think it just depends on what anecdotes you've been exposed to. So that I just want to go back to that 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 kind of steel manning, where I where I where in, in a certain in certain contexts, I do agree uh, that when you're working with kind of moderate frequencies and no one on the extremes of volume, because Another thing I've seen is um, as volumes become more popular and sometimes I'll get folks who have like a CrossFit background and come into bodybuilding or folks who do really high volumes with low frequencies, I have just with so many people either dropped volume and seen an increase in hypertrophy and a decrease in DOMS or kept volume the same, increased frequency and seen an increase in hypertrophy and a a decrease in DOMS to where I guess what I'm saying is that it can be predictive, it can be useful. But there are too many times where it has the exact opposite relationship for me to be comfortable uh, in, the, in, 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 that, in that kind of same way. It requires so many caveats. I'm not going to simply jettison it and be like, you're an idiot if you, if you try to use DOMS to tell you anything. Like, yeah, if you get DOMS, you definitely train that muscle group, right? How did it experience damage? Like you didn't get stabbed in the, the thigh in the middle of the night while you were asleep, right? Um, hopefully not. Or you need to check your, your windows locks and look for you know, gnomes with very small knives that don't leave scars because 
intracellular gnomes. Intracellular window kind of gnomes. gnomes. Yeah. So, like, I, I so I guess what I'm saying is that um, you can develop an extreme work capacity uh, that you're probably still going to get some DOMs. Like, you're not going to talk to, to CrossFit competitors and be like, I never get sore. But their work capacity is probably way beyond what is necessary for them to do the optimal amount of volume to produce hypertrophy. But they are quite well adapted and have a very robust repeated bout effect response or they wouldn't be able to do what they do. And they can recover performance. Um, and that recovery of performance may not be related to what's an appropriate volume for them to to grow at a maximal rate, which kind of sucks because I would love it if there was a really, really strong relationship with with all those variables. And I think in many cases there there is a useful relationship, but there's also a lot of cases where there is not. Um, cause I, I, Dom, Dom's isn't causative for, for hypertrophy. I think, I think we're on the same page there. Um, it's just whether or not it's, uh, when is it a useful, um, predictor or, or feedback mechanism? And I think there are times when it is, it is the exact opposite, but there are times when it may be useful. So, yeah, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. Uh, the like this can be just like a one word answer from both of you guys but have you seen like a big inter individual variability in that which would speak of my experience that um i seem to just not get sore once i'm adapted to the movements that i'm doing at very high volumes because when i was doing those 40 sets i did experience some subjective feelings of overreaching like i was feeling like crap <laughs> you know like i was actually feeling like really really drained uh, in between sessions, in the evenings, many hours after the sessions, but the soreness was still not there. So, like, could it be, like, individual differences in the connective tissue of the person, like how that is susceptible to be inflamed and things like that? Or um, what What have you seen in terms of the, the differences between people? I've worked with a whole bunch of athletes, and my suspicion is that fiber type, uh, muscle architectural design, I think, plays a big role. Fiber type plays a big role fiber distribution, I think if you tend to be more faster twitch, not only do you cramp more often in training, um, which you get the soreness from very low volumes, and also you grow the most. I don't think there's that, again, I think it's correlatory, but uh, faster fibers take on a fucking gigantic amount of damage. They have a real problem recovering from it, or they just the time courses very long. And also they are able to have very high levels of hypertrophy. Almost every... Uh, if I had to rank all the people I've ever worked with or seen up close work as to their ease with which they get sore versus how uh, hypertrophy do they become, uh, it would be a very tight correlation. That is very different from saying you should be as sore as possible. Um, I think for most of those athletes, when they get super mega sore, I would actually reduce their volume. And like Eric said, they see even better growth because they're doing too much per session. But on the other hand, some of the people that I've seen that get the worst results from hypertrophy programs never get sore. In some sense, maybe because they're under training and perceptively they're just not pushing as close to failure as you could. Uh, I think some of that happens, especially with uh, people that just maybe are in the wrong gym environment or something like that. But I think the people that are predominantly more slow twitch, um, uh, or vastly more slow twitch, I think they have a very hard time getting sore because they're so adapted. Their work capacity is incredible, both genetically and through training, which is how they got their fiber type. And I think they, uh, for the reason of fiber type and a couple other reasons, they also don't hypertrophy much. I've trained. Uh, five and 10,000 meter runners in, uh, in multiple sets of high rep squats. They walk through it like it's not even there. They don't even know what DOMS is. They're like, oh, that's some shit I got like 10 years ago when I started running. You can do an inordinate number of squats. They just don't give a shit. First of all, they don't get out of breath. They do, they do a set of 10 to failure. You have to get the bar off of them. And then they're like, oh, that was hard. And you're like, and they're like, I can do 10 more right now if you want. And you're like, okay, that doesn't make any goddamn sense. And it takes, I don't know how many sets of squats to get them sore because they just don't. It's also, unfortunately, basically just don't grow from resistance training as far as I can detect. And then you know, the athletes that I've worked with that are much more fast, which um, in nature, their one set of 10 causes them to bleed out of their eyes and vomit blood. They get a ton of uh, so essentially spastic muscle contractions shortly thereafter. They can't walk. Uh, and several sets of squats makes them sore for four or five days. Um, so that, that has been my observation. Well, with individuals and um, just just to sort of parlay that, I think not always, and like Eric said, I think the CrossFit example is a very good counterexample to 
effectiveness. But generally speaking, there is some research to confirm this. Uh, Brad Schoenfeld has referenced. Um, if you're a hard gainer, so to speak, it probably means you're more slow twitch dominant uh, than otherwise. More volume probably is the answer for the more gains that you're capable of getting genetically. So I would say if you don't get sore from any given exposure, you get sore less than someone else does, like your training partner, you may need more work sets than them to get your best possible response. That's my thing. Yeah. Unfortunately for me, that means that I'm... You're fucked, Abel. I'm not, I just, there's two I'm, word answer. You're fucked. Yeah, I'm not really cut out for muscle growth, which anybody... Looking at my physique, unfortunately, we'll probably agree. You look but. great. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> doesn't Eric, doesn't he look great? He looks fucking awesome. Yeah, I, dis- I, I, I disagree there. Yeah, you have a great physique. You look at you look at Instagram too much, man. Abel, I, it's no joke. Dude, seriously, Abel, like no joke, like real talk. You have like all your pictures on Instagram, which I curate, by the way. In my <laughs> mini Instagram, you could say. Uh, my parole officer can't hear this, by the way. So um, if you, you have the kind of like your physique, the pictures you post – is the physique that I suspect 90 something percent, 99 percent of men would just straight up, if they could press a button, they would look like you. I'm a little too freaky, a little too hairy. Eric's like the level of lean that, that scares people. That, you have that's that gone. physique right now. But that, <laughs> oh, that, now, Eric, you also have that great physique. But doesn't doesn't Abel have that physique where you look at it, you're like, oh, yeah. there's chest, shoulders, the, the fucking, the shoulder to waist ratio. Dude, you're like fucking, you're like Superman, you know? That's yeah, it. no one really wants to look like a competitive bodybuilder who's successful. Except other competitive bodybuilders, <laughs> and that's true of, of drug-free sure. and enhanced guys. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it was it was super not cool of me to not interrupt and joke it away, but hey, I took it. <laughs> well um, done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 it does speak to your point that like I I'm built much more so like an endurance athlete genetically than a strength trainee. I just you know worked really really hard and I got somewhere. But, you know, like I'm not the sort of blocky, strong, built, uh, fast switch type dude that you're talking about. In that sense, it does fit me perfectly. But but anyway, instead of uh, discussing my pretty or not so pretty physique, um, Eric, Beautiful. Eric, Eric uh, <laughs> uh, what, what do you think about the genetic uh, differences and soreness uh, thing? Yeah, I, I, um, I would love to know what predicts it. And I have – so it's weird. I've definitely seen some people – you know, Jeff Alberts is a great example. For every unit of volume he does, he gets wrecked, but grows very mm. well. Um, and I've definitely ran into people like that. They're a high responder on both the fatigue and stimulus side of it. Um, and I think that's pretty common. But there's also people who do more, get bigger, and can handle more. Um, and it's just like a very clear dial. And then once they start to do too much, they, they feel that it messes them up and you dial it back. Either one of those two scenarios typically make up the population of competitive bodybuilders who beat everybody else. Like if you look at um, the top five lineup at any high level bodybuilding show, it's going to be guys who do a crap ton of volume and are fine doing it um, at a high intensity as well. And kind of like look at other people like you're weak and don't understand why they are struggling to recover from whatever they're doing. Or it's folks who do very little get really jacked up by it, but grow really well from it. And then again, what kind of two dominant camps do we have? Basically hit in high volume work, right? So it's, I don't know what differentiates between those two, but that's pretty much everybody. Like you don't find many people um, who are kind of in the middle or like what we're talking about who are highly successful. So there's like, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle and I'm, I have gotten far in competitive natural bodybuilding. Um, but I am by no means an elite competitive natural bodybuilder. Um, and, uh, yeah, like for my frame, I'm, I'm not that big. Um, so there, there's, there's something to it. And I have definitely seen as a coach, a ton of individual variability. Um, and then it's even more confusing because it gets, it gets modified by training frequency, you know, uh, even when you see the same level of growth, like we talked about, you can see less or more. Uh, delayed onset muscle soreness when you manipulate frequency. And that that may mean that, hey, when you go to a higher frequency and you get less DOMS, that therefore you can handle more volume and benefit from it. Um, and that is probably true in many instances. But like we both brought up like the CrossFit example. There's a certain point where even if you are somehow able to handle that workload and fatigue 
uh, that's not the same as you getting uh, better better results from it from a, a, a cross-sectional area increase perspective. You might have just maxed out your anabolic signaling pathways at that point, and your recovery, your work capacity is just like twofold greater than the max, what it takes to max out anabolic signaling. So you're just at, at the very best just treading water after you do some number of sets, and at the very worst just actually causing damage and taking away from. Even though you can keep grinding, the yeah. grind does no net benefit to you. You know, and actually that, that that's kind of well represented by the studies on very lowly trained or untrained people. Like I think just recently published in 2019, a study by Gomez et al. It did exactly what we were talking about. It had two different um, volumes at two different, or so the same volume at two different frequencies, measured hypertrophy and actually measured delayed onset muscle soreness. And they, I think it was a one versus two times per week split. So the one, one group did a body part split. The other group did a full body. So one did two times per week, one did one uh, per, each, per each muscle group, same hypertrophy or very similar numbers and not statistically different, um, but much more muscle soreness or significantly more muscle soreness in the group doing it once per week. But they're, they're very untrained or beginners. So like they're only going to grow so fast, <laughs> you know, it, it, all, all we can say from that is that um, they were probably growing as much as they were going to grow and muscle soreness was just what it was and it wasn't a useful predictor in that context so yeah just as a just really quick since we're talking forever anyway might as well make it needy um and maybe i think eric has a lot of uh, good things to say about this topic um, as he always does you know, last captain america uh, stop it <laughs> someone put him on the white house steps and give him a fucking microphone this man has things to say uh, about training of course the, and everyone's like what that's are you right talking about, about anything, bigger problems anything, in our country and i'm like no, do we nonsense. Yeah. Not do we really Trump? <laughs> and then the American flag is just is sort of like you know waving in the background fluidly as you speak. That's how anytime you speak, but I can't see you like Val. Let's imagine there's an American flag waving in the background. Um, I'm good with that. Sweet. So uh, <laughs> what I want to say is, and because we've sort of hinted at this, uh, kind of poked the bear a little bit this entire time. Um, I think it is maybe not high time. It is always high time. Uh, it is in- becoming increasingly obvious. To me in conversations with other fitness professionals and with interested folks that just want to learn more, it's very valuable to understand the limitations of studies on untrained people. Um, and, and, and it's not to say that those studies are not valuable, but it's to understand the limitations is to put them in a context properly situated so that we don't go making fools of ourselves and really pay the ultimate price of lost gains, right? Um, and anytime a new study comes out that says some crazy shit or even if a study comes out that says some stuff we thought was true and is reinforcing our biases, you've got to look at the training age of the participants at least at some point, because some stuff that looks like it makes no damn sense at all in beginners makes all the sense of the world in intermediate advance and so on and so forth. And, and I mean, Eric, Eric, do you have any enabled, you have anything to add to this? Cause it just, it irks me to no fucking limit where people are like, Oh, this is the ultimate split to do. I'm like, yeah, if you're 19 years old, male college student who's never lifted weights, sure. Who gives a shit? You just go in and move around. You'll get jacked if you're like that. Like, and, and the unfortunate, the most unfortunate part is the people who mostly read those studies are the hard gainers who have been training for five to seven years. And none of that shit applies to them anymore. Folks make me seem like I'm not the only crazy person. Dr. Helms. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also don't want people to go so far as to use that to dismiss their biases when they see studies on untrained individuals. So A, sure. agree. B, there are definitely times when an untrained population is useful. Like if we're looking at some kind of novel thing that no one's been exposed to. or Which is fundamental physiological right. uh, elements like protein signaling cascades, things yes. like that. When we're answering stuff, conceptual questions. Yes. Rather but like than, details of a program, yeah. come on. Programming specifics, exactly, is, is where that, that may or may how, not make sense. How many sets does it take to generate optimal hypertrophy per session? Yep. That is very, very specific to, the, to potentially very specific to the training age of the individual. Yeah. I, you know, the, here's a funny thing though. Um, I haven't seen a, so the volume thing with training age, it's something I, I repeat a lot. I say, and it, it does seem to hold up to some degree. Um, but I, I have definitely seen that in, especially it's more obvious in people who respond well to low volumes because they just don't 
need more of an increase as they go on or, or the increase is just a little bit, you know, like I think, um, I think a lot of the times you, you may need to do more than you're currently doing if you're struggling to grow. But then once you figure out that volume, you just kind of got to keep the proximity to failure appropriate and improve other qualitative aspects. And you may not find that five years from now, there's been a huge increase in number of total sets for your training age. Um, this is something I've kind of come upon again and again and again when I like to sit down and, and, and just shoot the shit with high level uh, bodybuilders. It's like, how much has your volume come up since your like second season? Not much, but you're bigger. Yeah. You know, and it, of course the, the changes aren't much like stage weight may only be a couple, a couple pounds that we're talking to, um, you know, natural bodybuilders, but uh, it, that, that's a tough one. I do think there's a point when you need to increase more volume. And it's like when you go from late stage novice to intermediate or from intermediate to advanced uh, to kind of, you know, just do enough to get that same reasonable rate of muscle growth. But then from that point, it, it's not a, a dial you can really turn effectively um, or maybe, maybe the rate of progress is so slow either way that it's just not worth it. I don't know, but I've, um, that's something I've been questioning more and more and more because I do think there's a time when it makes sense and a time it doesn't. And that's why I would love to see more research on highly trained uh, individuals to see what gets to move the needle for them. So I, I don't I think totally it's so agree. simple as more volume sometimes. No, for sure. And sometimes the intensity, the, the loading increase uh, accounts for all of the stress uh, increase yeah. that you need. I think in later careers, especially with guys using drugs, when they get super, super strong, you actually have a, a, a quantitative reduction in the number of sets you can recover mm. from because the load becomes so fucking insane and your technique becomes better. Your mind-muscle connection becomes better. That you just get more out of every exercise. Uh, so I think there's sometimes a reduction there. But the thing about the studies on beginners is like when you have a study on zero to eight weeks of training, I'm trying to apply that to get like real-world recommendations for people in – who have been training for two years to two years and eight months is already highly problematic, Mm. right? Like, gee, you know, it might be the case, may be a good place to start thinking about. But a lot of folks read these studies and they just treat them as religious dogma. They're like, well, this is how much I should train. Like, man, that's not, yeah, for someone who's eight months in that group of people, sure, that's a fine idea. But I just think that a lot happens, not a lot happens with volume adaptation from three years plus to 10 years plus, I don't think from set number, maybe not a ton, but I think a yeah. lot can happen between four weeks into training and two years into training. And I think a lot of people just assume that's kind of the same. Yeah. I think I was thinking about this specifically uh, a couple of different lines of research and reviews and things and observations all kind of clamored around my head. I was thinking about the, uh, how heavier individuals typically do less reps at a given percentage 1RM. Uh, heavier individuals also tend to be stronger. Uh, and the while in many ways, like obviously RPE based on RIR is going to have a much more direct relationship with percentage of 1RM because that's going to be in a large, strong indicator on how many reps you can do. But the difficulty uh, perceived RPE might have more to do with absolute load in some cases, and certainly the energy expenditure. Systemic fatigue. Right. Absolutely. You know, because as you get disproportionately strong for your body size, um, the energy expended even by a single rep is crazy. And I was watching um, some of the live streaming or some of the recorded streams of the Arnold. And when these guys are trying to lift the Austrian oak, that's a 430-pound um, log. Oh, my God. The, the most reps anybody got, I think, was two. Um, Half Thor almost got three. I think Martin Lisi's almost got three. And they had, I want to say, two to three minutes to get as many reps as they could or something like that. But you watch them do one rep with that log, and they are, look like they just ran a 400-meter race. Full aerobic effort. Absolutely. Like, it's just and, – and they and they need rest. They sit down. They're, they're just – it's obviously the uh, – a lot of our perceived difficulty and the effort uh, expended and how many reps we can do is directly tied to the percentage of 1RM, the relative intensity. But there's a lot of things that are actually tied to the absolute load, like our energy expenditure. Um, when you are strong enough that 135 goes from being your 1RM to 50% of your 1RM, and now you can literally do 20 plus reps with your 1RM, um, the energy expenditure is much higher. 
uh, and the recovery. And that, that has some relationship with recovery and the fatigue generated. Um, and then when you take that out to when you've got really, really big people, so you, you've gained weight and gained strength, um, you get this, this disproportionate curve that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so, for example, uh, the Arnold Classic competitors in the strongman division who weigh 350 pounds and are lifting sometimes when they're pulling like an elephant bar three times their body weight, but an absolute load of a, a thousand plus pounds. That's that's I think it's just hard for people to conceive that even though that's a one RM deadlift, that's very different than when your one RM deadlift is less than half of that um, and, and relative to your body mass. So I think um, we do need more data on well-trained lifters because there are some things that happen when you get super strong or super big uh, that, that change kind of some of even the relative things we experience that are just not the same. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, a quick, a quick uh, it's like training example of that is if um, a high-level strongman writes a training program just assuming that he is the template and his peers are the template for how the body works at any weight, at any level of experience, if he writes a, tr- a training program for someone who weighs 110 pounds, he may have in there once a week work up to heavy deadlift single or triple or set of five. A person who weighs 110 pounds can do that and be like, so what's next? Mm-hmm. And you're like, aren't you beat up? And they're like, no, I thought that was a warm up. You're like, no, that's it. That's your workout. But if someone on the other hand of uh, a really science nerdy 110 pounder uh, or, you know, some strong man says, okay, this guy really knows what he's doing. Let, let have him write me a training program. They're going to write him 10 by 10 squat. And after the sixth set of 10, he's going to die literally <laughs> in the gym. Uh, it's going to be a problem. You know, unless comically, he's not going to die. He's going to get through six sets, be unable to continue and then be sore for two and a half weeks and be like, this is just not possible for me to do. And there's going to be this disconnect. Well, I thought this was a trained athlete that had a really high work capacity. And like Eric said, intensity uh, your ability to handle load does not scale linearly uh, with training age. And there are some nuances there that uh, an analysis only on beginners does not predict and the other way around. Yeah. And you you see this in, in super heavyweight powerlifters across the board uh, training in a different band of volume than you see 74 kilo lifters. Uh, even a low volume 74 kilo lifter, I can almost guarantee is doing more volume when you look at it from like relative volume load or number of sets than a super heavy working sets. It's just the nature of the beast. Eric does Jeff's, uh, Jeff Alberts is uh, volume set volume per week exceed 10 sets at, at this point even. So typically he is hitting each muscle group around, I think twice per week and doing three to six sets per muscle group per session. So he's looking at six to 12 sets per muscle group. So he's on like, he's still actually in the range of what the meta-analysis would say is, you know, if you take the average there, it's, it's eight, you know, it's, it's so, um, people treat him like he is the, the lowest volume guy ever, but uh, man, people don't like people need to pay attention to what the hit, the hit people out there, the hit craze, like they were doing like one set per fortnight sometimes, you know, and surprisingly making okay gains, but not great. Um, and certainly you don't see that at all at the highest level of bodybuilding. But there are, I would say, you know, Je- Jeff's kind of like one standard deviation below normal, but still pretty normal in my opinion from what I've seen. And do you think we can equivocally say that if he was to try to do something like what you're doing, maybe not with as much volume, but 15 sets and doing like four or five sessions a week, like small amounts of volume per session and upping his volume by you know, maybe 30 to 50% over the course of a couple of months, gradually working up, he would get objectively worse results. Uh, yeah. What do you think? Well, I mean, he, he's, it's also a funny thing where people, they'll see a snapshot of what you, how you train. And one, they think that's how you've always trained, how you currently train, how you always will train and that you have never tried anything else. Um, and Jeff has trained muscle groups. I think, three times per week. Uh, Jeff has trained with, I think as much as four times this volume at different points in his career. Um, and Jeff is not just maintaining anymore. I've, I've watched him progress from 2009 till now. And it's, he's someone who pays attention. Like he has a keen eye for observation yeah. and he changes things. He keeps things super, super the same and then changes a variable based on what happens. Um, and he, was heavily influenced by us initially and actually increased his volume. 
um, to his benefit, uh, but then found that he took it too far and then drew it back. So he is doing more volume than when I met him in 2009. Um, but less than the amount of when he initially met us and went, oh, I need to be training like these research guys think. Um, and then, you know, found that it was too much. So the, uh, I think we can equivocally say that having tried higher volumes and had less recovery um, and still growing now on less volume, this probably works better. He's also someone who is 48 uh, and is has very, very little room left to, before his head starts touching the genetic ceiling of what he can gain as, as, a, as, as Jeff Alberts. I'd also point out that he is one of the least injured um, athletes I've ever seen at his age and training experience, considering he's been training since he was a teenager and has been competing since 93. Um, so I think... Like that, that, that typically tells me he's doing a lot of things. And he was also a factory worker. Like he was, had a, a highly, highly active job for, uh, I think 12 years. He might've been working at Numi. Um, so when he, you know, his, his, again, you're, you're the appropriate volume for someone is dictated by other factors and he's not going to quit his job. That's giving him benefits and, and, and a home and a stable income so that he could do more volume and it didn't seem to hurt him anyway because he was doing quite well but yeah but as someone else he could yeah. gain more <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> so i i guess um i i think we can safely say that that jeff is one of those examples of a high responder and someone who gets a lot of fatigue from every unit of volume but because of his his nature as a hard-working a very, very serious competitor. There were times when even being that person, he was pushed his volumes way up, did higher frequencies, trained to failure, and really, really crushed himself in the gym. And that was, at least we can say, not necessary to produce progress as he's making progress on much less now. Um, and whether it is optimal or not, I'm going to kind of quote something I say a lot. If you're progressing at all as an advanced lifter, the distinction between whether you're progressing optimally or suboptimally is so minute that you're never going to know it and it functionally doesn't matter. Because if you're a high level advanced lifter and you're gaining strength or gaining size, you're doing enough right that I'm comfortable saying don't change it. Yeah. And someone could play devil's advocate and say that he could have gotten that there faster if he upped his volume earlier. Yes. That's and then I not that that matters in the grand scheme of things. It's just one thing. And I could devil's advocate right back and say, or he would have gotten an injury. You know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're assuming that that volume increase is sustainable. There's no reason. And then I will devil's advocate. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. A lot of devils here. <laughs> yeah. I will devil's advocate and just say, fuck you, just outright. I'm done arguing. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I think we're going to switch gears and talk about nutrition now. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this is one of the proudest moments uh, of my life because I just taken you guys over two hours. Holy shit. Like, I'm Joe Rogan or whatever. Like, uh, I can afford to do this shit. I can be abusive of people's time. No, just kidding. Um, we come here to be with you. <laughs> um, no, I'm... I've known every Hungarian I've known has been abusive. Probably. Yeah, no. Don't mess with Hungarians. Wow. We fin and, and, we, and we finished with racism. I yeah. love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ethnocentrism, thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with the two of you guys. Um, you are two of the my top three favorite people in this entire industry. So uh, one of them better be yourself. Now nah, the third one is uh, <laughs> nah, couldn't come up with any, anyone funny. Anyway, um, who is someone funny? I could, Lyle uh, McDonald, uh, John Ke John Kiefer, John Kiefer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, thank you so much for doing this, guys. Uh, it's been an incredible discussion and people will take a ton of value out of it. And this is like crack for the hardest nerds, uh, the most OCD people. Maybe not the audience I want to attract, but hey, I just did it. So whatever. But thank you so much. Um, do you guys want to let the people know where they can catch up on the latest projects you have coming up and all those things? The number three, the letter D, musclejourney.com for all courses, books, research reviews that I do. And then check me out on Iron Culture every Monday with uh, Omar Isif, my guest host, where we dissect from a historical, cultural, and uh, science-based perspective, lifting culture and community. And then lastly, if you want to stay more up to date with my day-to-day, -day, Instagram, I am at Helms3DMJ. Perfect.
Dr. Isretel? Uh, at R-P-D-R-M-I-K-E on Instagram for half naked pictures of me. Sometimes more than half naked if you go by percentage area covered. <laughs> and um, at RP Strength, Renaissance Periodization, company I co-founded for stuff. We got all kinds of it. Um, we have an app, the RP Diet app. I don't know how useful it'll be to listeners of this particular podcast, but if you're tired of people saying they need help with diet coach and they can't afford one for $15, a month, our app will diet coach you. And uh, so that's neat. And then uh, James Hoffman and I, Dr. James Hoffman, my colleague and co-author of many of our books, uh, we do a weekly webinar on our uh, pay site. Uh, that sounds terrible. Let me rephrase. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, RP Plus, um, it's 10 bucks a month to join. But the good news is you no longer have to join because these webinars are going to be on YouTube. And we're going to be taking all questions from RP Plus askers and three questions from YouTubers from now on. So if you search RP Plus uh, webinar on YouTube, it's almost certainly going to come up. And then basically what we do is we just answer questions that people ask us in super depth every time each quote unquote podcast or webinar or whatever is like an hour and a half to two hours long. We beat the shit out of every question. Uh, so if you like that sort of thing, which I suspect if you listen to uh, Abel's podcast, you probably do or you're highly masochistic. Either way, join us uh, on the internet. We'll see you there digitally. And then, by the way, that's a copyrighted phrase. I don't want to. Perfect. And I just have 10 minutes of ads for the end. I hope you guys don't mind listening to it while we're here. Just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. You too, man. Thanks for having us. All right. Awesome. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, then please, once again, consider dropping a five-star rating on iTunes. It would mean a lot to me and it would be truly helpful. And if you're interested in more cool stuff, then you could visit my YouTube channel. If you type in Sustainable Self-Development Podcast there or even SSD Podcast, it will come up. And if you're interested in working together with me, then you can check out the Calendly link in the show description. There you can book a free call with me. We can hop on that call, chat about your goals, challenges, determine if we are a good fit. And if that is the case, then we could be working together going forward to get you to the results that you want. So that's all I had to say for today. I hope you enjoyed this once again. And with that, see you next time.